people don't want to look at me as a person who's a victim. But now, the evidence is overwhelmingly clear. I had this weird thing where I was like, staring in the mirror, raging narcissist, and I was like, feeling like I was seeing other dimensions or feeling changes in myself or something. I felt nothing because I'm a sociopath. I'm actually joking right now. I'm not actually a sociopath, but the fact that I had to clarify that to you is kind of terrifying. So here's my apology. Um, uh, okay. Bye. Aren't you playing hero right now? I, I think you forgot what character you're playing. It sounds like he got off on having you end your career while he used you to promote him. Oh, the ultimate submission. So when you guys call me brave, remember you're just talking to a ghost. On February 9th of 2023, it was reported that a lawsuit is being filed against Gregory Jackson, otherwise known as YouTuber Onision. He told you in that exclusive interview that he doesn't even know the woman who named him in the lawsuit. Yeah, and people may recognize this man. He's known by Greg or James Jackson, but he's better known as Onision. For using his YouTube channels to recruit, solicit, and groom multiple young women. She claimed she was by one of the most famous YouTubers and his spouse when she was just a teen. Now, Onision's YouTube channel banner has a graveyard with his profile picture spelling out the words, rest in peace. It was gone, just boink! Controversial YouTube banned from Patreon after alleged doxing. Onion Sun has been demonetized. <laughs> He's been demonetized. Greg has lost and been kicked out of the YouTube partnership Program. Greg, or Onision, continues to claim innocence. Wow, you would really do that. You would really do that! <laughs> you tried to do the FBI, it didn't work! You tried to do the police, it didn't work! So instead, you resort to the paycheck, and you got it! You got it! But does the years and years of evidence documented across multiple social media platforms tell a different story? So apparently Anissian is being sued. If you don't remember, Anissian is an old YouTuber that has had a lot of allegations. Chris Hansen was looking into him at one point. Throughout the history of YouTube, there's of course been no shortage of creeps on the platform. However, there's always existed one champion atop this mountain of weirdos, one alpha goober of <laughs> Thanos of online accused predators. His name is Onision. There we go. Oh, oh I think I said Onision. Oh, Onion Boy. It's most experts' opinions, as well as most viewers' opinions, that Onision is a dangerous person and that his toxicity should not be justified nor monetized. People call me weird. I don't know why you call me weird, but it's kind of a harsh word for me. I mean, I'm not too strange, I'm not too crazy. You call me crazy and maybe I'll go crazy. Onision distorted reality, targeting the same type of victims over and over again and using the same tactics. He victimized himself, painted young girls out to be the abusers, and used his exes and other relationships as a shield or a way to continue luring more victims into his web. But when you suck the life out of so many young women and people, eventually their souls will seek revenge once they've rejuvenated and realized what you've done. I mean, he's a he's done a lot of really weird videos. Is this somebody who should have a YouTube channel, in your opinion? No. Uh, he has like a cult-like following. And now Onision is so far buried into the ground, there's no way he can dig himself back up and out to the surface. So let's revel upon the graveyard of the lost soul of the YouTuber Onision, one of the scariest tales on the YouTube platform. Before we get into the world of Onision, I'm so excited to say that this video is sponsored by Rocket Money. My partner and I have been using Rocket Money for months now to manage our finances. And especially in 2023, now almost 2024, where did the time go? There are so many reasons for wanting to manage your finances 
and needing a little extra assistance. When I tell you, it's a little embarrassing how many free trials I signed up for and then completely forgot that I signed up for until I'm alerted by Rocket Money that they started charging our bank account. I'm also still trying to save up for home renovations, as I noted the last time I worked with Rocket Money. Slow and steady wins the race. And Rocket Money is an extremely helpful app for saving more and managing your money. My husband and I love using Rocket Money to cancel unwanted subscriptions that I may have signed up for. Rocket Money safely and securely identifies reoccurring charges and can cancel unwanted subscriptions for you. Rocket Money has saved its customers an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. On top of that, Rocket Money helps you set budgets, which is extremely helpful if you have any financial goals, which I mean, don't we all have some sort of financial goal. Analyze your spending habits to create a custom budget that works with your lifestyle. Automatically monitor your spending by category and get notifications when you've exceeded your limits. Take control of your finances today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash coolworldhappymind to get started for free. That's rocketmoney.com slash coolworldhappymind or click the link in the video description. And thank you so much to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. I wanted to give a huge shout out to the website Life of Onion, which is just a massive well of research into the story of Onision with a ton of information that is now wiped from the internet, especially different tweets and recountings of events that I probably wouldn't have been able to find if not for the website Life of Onion. In fact, this website has even more than what we'll be discussing in this video, so the link to the website Life of Onion will be at the top of my research document. If you want to learn more about Onision and this topic in general, I highly, highly encourage you to check out this website specifically. Onision recounts his own birth in a journal entry titled Umbilical of Death. I was born silently and blue. My head was 14 and a half inches around and my chest was 13 and a half. Now about the umbilical cord. It was wrapped around my neck three times. They had to cut it off as soon as I was born. I guess that was easier without movement. So it all started when my mom pushed me out of her- So when I initially came out, I wasn't breathing due to the fact that I had my umbilical cord wrapped around my neck three times. Onision was born Gregory James Daniel on November 11th, 1985 in Auburn, Washington. Onision grew up lower class, allegedly due to his father being inconsistent with child support. His mother had to work whatever job she could to pay the bills, many of which required hard labor. Onision spent most of his childhood living on a farm with his mother and his two sisters. The pews. At age two, I was told I fell off the back of a church chair head first and smacked my head on the ground. My mom ran screaming out of the church, blood everywhere, Humpty Dumpty. When I was seven, one of the few stories I can recall occurring before age 11, I went to work with my stepfather. He was welding on his and his brother's boat on a cement docking when I decided to be a daredevil. I wanted to crawl across the ship's face right in front of the very top window. That's when the wind blew. On the shores of Washington state, I lie, bumped and not broken, falling head first off the boat's lip onto cement, all the time trying to save myself by latching onto the chain, connected to nothing. The chain fell with me, and the only way my stepfather had known I fell was by the screams I let out as I rubbed my head in pain. Through his early childhood, Onision detailed two events where he had suffered traumatic head injuries. Based on multiple studies, traumatic brain injuries are linked to a decline in mental health. TBI often results in impairing and persistent mental illnesses, such as ADHD, aggression, personality change, in addition to broad social cognitive and social function impairment. Early on, Greg documented an obsession towards relationships and a tendency towards violence. 
Netherlands, like in his entry first fight. Around second grade, I thought I fell in love with a girl, so I spent time with her every day. One day, a boy had decided to tell me she was his girlfriend. He said some nasty things, so I asked her if she minded watching me beat him. She said she did not, so I turned around and began swinging as hard and as fast as I could. The recess coach saw us and began screaming like a madwoman to stop. When it was over, he was crying. I remember smiling. Greg's obsession with his love life continued and his journal entries become even more dark, like in his entry, First Kiss. When I was 11, I had my first kiss. She was gorgeous, 15-year-old girl named Julia. It was someone I'd met at my father's church. I recall something very clearly she said, you have the heart of a 15-year-old. The next year, we went back to that cabin we kissed in and found out she loved another, Michael. By that time, she and I had lost touch. The news did not hit me until years later. By that time, they had broken up. Michael is a year younger than I am. At age 11, Onision had his first kiss with an older girl. He recalled how the older girl pointed out their age difference, telling him that he had the heart of a 15-year-old. Onision was likely being by someone who was older with more experience and more maturity. The next year, that same girl, who is now 16 years old, began an intimate relationship with another boy who was 11 at that time. Journal entry, infatuation of Michael's sister. At about age 15, I fell for Jennifer, Michael's sister. For the longest time, I had eyes for her. She was always so fun, full of energy and life, but yet she never really had any experience with boys. Maybe that's something I liked. I liked teaching people about everything. In this journal entry, Onision recalled having a crush on a girl named Jennifer. They both attended his father's church. He noted how she was inexperienced with boys, falling in love with her purity. Onision stated that he likes teaching people about everything. Into Onision's teen years, he spent most of his time designing websites, graphics, and making music. And his mother sent Greg to live with his father full-time, who lived in Ohio. And while Greg was living in Ohio with his father, he continued with his passion of developing websites. Onision first created the website The Cries of the Crypt, or TCTC, in 2001. The site hosted music, pictures, and other forms of media. On the site, Onision created a general advice page, an unqualified 15 to 16 year old acting as a therapist for random people on the internet shows the ego that was building in Gregory, who began began more and more to think that he knew what was best for others. One of the cries of the crypt journal entries read, Socializing has never stopped bothering me. This doesn't include everyone I know, but most people are afraid of the truth, afraid of what's going on inside my head. So I'm the freak just because I'm not your average teen. People anger me. Luckily, I can control my actions, keeping my straight jacket off. Gregory's net name at the time was Otacon, a mixture of the words odd and Otacon, a character from the video game series Metal Gear Solid. Entry 3. Music and emotion help increase my mind's rank, and I'm filled with knowledge from far beyond the average. I believe I see what none other ever have been through it all, but experiencing nothing. It's a lot of words without saying much. While staying with his father in Ohio, Greg met a girl named Christina, and Greg says he noticed Christina because she laughed at everything he said. Greg says one time I at lunch, he was trying to get Christina's attention when she was talking to her friends, but she kept ignoring him. When Greg was walking away, Christina asked him where he was going. I raised my arm, half bent like a switch my middle finger high. Christina found him after school and asked him why he acted the way he did. And Greg explained to Christina that she disrespected him and that Greg was enraged by it. When Christina asked how she could fix it, Greg told her to come to school the next day as gothic as possible, and she complied. But Greg's relationship with Christina resulted in an incident between himself and his father where he ended up in juvie. Greg says, one day, he wanted to go see Christina, but his dad wouldn't let him. Greg called his dad's wife an effing B, and according to Greg, his father started 
kicking him. And then Greg started kicking his father. Randy eventually called the police and Greg was placed in juvenile hall for the extent of damage that he did to his father. But Nisiang continues to claim that he acted in self-defense in this incident. In his entry, The Story with My Father, Greg goes even further to victimize himself, saying, My father, Randy Gray, is accused of being a violator, a liar, a fraud, even wicked. He tormented me for a short duration when I lived in his house for six months. He lied to me so often. He struck me violently for calling his wife a name, a cuss word. What have I done to him? Fought back, fought to get home with my sane parent, my mother, Tammy Jane. From Onision's perspective, he was the complete victim of this situation, along with several other incidents with his father, it seems. From early on, a pattern starts to emerge where Onision always victimizes himself or becomes the victim of any given situation, even when he very clearly inflicted harm onto another person. The tactic of playing the victim can be a strategy used to manipulate you. There are legitimate reasons to feel victimized in your life, but there are people who play the victim in order to manipulate you. Signs that someone is playing the victim in order to manipulate the other person are, they don't take responsibility. They try to shift all the blame onto you or some other outside force. They don't take in your care and compassion. They often try to get you to do something to fix their pain. They're solely focused on their problems and minimize or ignore your needs and feelings. And they're master manipulators, and often their manipulation is covert. Onision claimed he was being constantly victimized by his father, Randy, and his stepmother, Deborah but Randy and Deborah have a much different story. According to Randy and Deborah, Greg was a difficult teenager who did not want to follow any rules. I was 19 the last time I talked to this clown. We tried to keep our distance because this kid being so toxic. I told our neighbor, if you see anything strange going on in our house, call the police because Greg was getting so out of control, Deborah said. Greg threatened to burn down the house a couple of times when he was going off on some of his tangents, Randy said. Whenever he would get angry and start yelling and cursing and calling us all sorts of names, it was just kind of escalating. So I was afraid that there would be a physical altercation, and that's why I called the police. I told the officers, look, I need help. Can you explain to Greg that he has to listen to his parents and can't do whatever he wants? During a road trip to Nashville, he was listening to his music and had it up very, very loud. I said, Greg, please turn your music down, and he said he wouldn't do it. It, so I pulled off on the exit. I stopped, turned around, and said, Greg, turn your music down. And that's when he went off. He started screaming and was just gonna bolt. He was gonna leave. And so I turned around, unbuckled my seatbelt, and tried to reach and grab his shoulders to keep him from leaving. Debbie was trying to untie his shoes and he was kicking at me, broke my glasses, and bloodied my nose. Passersby called the police, Randy said, and Greg was then taken into custody at a juvenile detention center. We never saw him take responsibility except that one time when he's behind bars, Deborah said. He was acting like a normal scared kid at that point. Based on Randy and Deborah's recollection, they seemed scared of Anision. And after he came home from juvenile detention, Greg returned to live with his mother in Washington. Mom, people are saying there's something wrong with my brain. That's ridiculous, Greg. Good trees don't make bad nuts. So you calling me crazy? Oh yeah. Living with his mother Tammy again, Onision began developing new websites. The first was hybrideye.com, which he made in 2002 to share his literature and music and to advertise his Sin Within Inc. web design company. On the site, Onision wrote his opinion on various topics, from the Stone Age to terror. The second site that Onision developed was Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance.com. The site included information and speculation about the game Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance before it hit the shelves. In 2010, a person claiming to be a former member of Onision's Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance forum came forward and talked about their experience interacting with Onision. I've known Onision online for a long time now, since 
since before the Air Force, since before he graduated. He must have been about 15 when I came across one of his old forums. It was a small community before message boards really started booming. I went by many aliases back then. He knows who I am very well. Onision was admin. He ruled with an iron fist. He furiously attacked anything different from him, even taking administrative action. He turned his entire community against him. His behavior was always erratic. Oh my god! Metal Gear! He would get extremely angry if you ever questioned him, criticized him, contradicted him, etc. It became very apparent to all of us early on that he was mentally ill. At first, his delusions were minor. They were totally unrealistic. But he definitely saw himself as above other human beings. As time went on, the delusions started manifesting in more serious ways. He literally believed in supernatural things. Imagine my surprise when I saw those ghost parody videos. He was making fun of himself, denying his past all the while. Hey, you know what we should do? What? We should split up. We should. I'm gonna go cover the bedroom and you cover the uh, outside. Yeah. Okay. Right, this is guy. I'm investigating the f ghost and this super crazy chick's house. I'm going in the first room. There's nothing in here because ghosts are losers! Which would all be peachy if you don't understand the extent that his ghost hunting went. Him, his wife, and his sister-in-law all became deluded together. They would walk around taking pictures of dust orbs and calling them ghosts, collectively, mind you. Not only that, but they had a profile section where each of them claimed to have specific supernatural powers. Many of us got banned for arguing the ghosts were dust orbs. He was extremely intolerant. Onision at this time was even developing his own religion. This religion was called Sikeska, Sikeska, Sikeska. I don't know if there's a correct way to pronounce that. Sorry to all Sikeska believers out there for offending the pronunciation. And for a very long time, Greg held his beliefs in Sikeska very seriously. And what are these Sikeska beliefs? This religion had its very own website in which it claimed its beliefs were the earth creates energy at its center. Humans can came from the earth and our purpose is to protect the earth and its inhabitants. Humans are the most advanced species on earth and they were not meant to kill each other or other species. Our bodies are shells used to feed our spirits. Hey guys, do you understand the concept of guardian angels? Like they're basically sent from God or everybody has a guardian angel that protects them from demons and stuff. I don't know. There's theories out there that I've heard of. I was only taught about guardian angels briefly as a child, but I always thought it was cool to have this little protector around me. And uh, Sezeska is not so different when it comes to guardian angels and the concept, except instead of being created and sent to you by God or whatever, it's created by yourself. Um, you can you can have literally a goat <laughs> as, a, as a guardian angel or whatever you so choose. The disturbing part of Greg's religion is an email he sent titled Hello Margaret, in which he tries to recruit this person into his religion by saying, well, some pretty wild things. I'm often associated Path. I find that you described yourself somewhat in this way too. If I'm being damaged emotionally to an extreme extent, like if someone is breaking up with me or someone just cheated on me, my emotions will shut down and I will begin saying things that I mean, but in a stronger sense, more blunt sense. My ex-girlfriend's sister, which I began to love like family, she told me she wished I would die. She wished I would not exist. I smiled and said she was horrible for saying those things. I said she was ugly on the inside side, that she did not deserve to look at me. I made her cry many times due to what she said to me. In a way, this makes me a monster. In a way, this makes me a god. Sighs deeply. I invented a religion, one I believe anyone who wants peace towards, not on earth, and less discrimination in our lives would follow. It follows the philosophy that we all come from the earth. It is our true mother, and that any hand which hurts it, disrespects it, should fall back to it, so they may be used to feed those less destructive, such as the soil. You should see it too, Sikeska. Most people call me crazy for making it up, so I asked them how their religion came about. It's always started by men like me, only I am honest. Um, so that's interesting. The most cultish parts of the Sikeska belief is the section on what Greg believes is the purpose of humans. The purpose of humans. In the previous sections, there have been discussions as to the purpose of humans, to assist the logic 
logic behind the Sikeskin belief in the meaning of life. This purpose was said to work towards advancements of the human civilization, to the point in which we are able to protect the mother of our species, Earth. Beyond this, what is there? Why are we here? Above yet, beside these objectives, comes a tremendously unexplored realm, which we humans fortunately have the ability to partake in, the Devant realm. Those equipped with the right knowledge will, can, travel into the unseen world of Devant to assist the savants in forcing away the Zodin that at times consumes their post-physical realm existences. By controlling and exploring Devant, we can also eliminate physical realm threats, such as bioweapon construction and many more crime-related activities. <laughs> our human shells provide an energy which feeds and supports our spirits, while supplying them with a greater potential than any Zodin could ever desire. This sounds like some strange sci-fi novel that's somewhat delirious and incohesive, mixed with a little bit of Scientology. The idea of not harming another living being, saving and protecting other creatures, is often something Onision brings up as a core identity that he sees within himself. Even when his actions throughout his entire history seem so contradictory and so blatantly harmful. So why does Onision see himself as a savior? It all could relate back to humans ourselves, how we often want to protect the world that we're simultaneously destroying. Or it could be a mask and a shield to keep everyone, even his own consciousness, protected from his true, dangerous self. With as much work as Onision put into his relationships, his websites, developing entire religions, you'd think he'd be some sort of super genius who was able to excel in school fairly easily, right? Well, it turns out that wasn't the case. Onision graduated high school with a 2.54 GPA. During Greg's last year of high school, he met the person that would eventually become his wife, Sky. Alright, so most real men watch sports like baseball and football and NASCAR. So, What's up? How you doing? Not violent yet. Yeah, all them over here. Oh, okay. I like your accent. That's very cool. Good compliment. What? Oh, sh. I've known Skye since 2003. She acted like I was a weirdo for talking to her, but I kept going back. Every time I had class with her, saying hey Skye and other random things to start a conversation. Like many others, I chose her to talk to because she stood out. She had a dark aura around her. The school year ended and we did not see each other for quite some time. She was logged onto AOL one day and I spoke with her. She invited me over and I told her that it would be cool to see her again. From that point on, I would drive out to see her and pick her up on occasion to come over to my house. I would play my random tunes in my car and sing along to them on the way, sometimes in a silly voice with a goofy grin on my face, bumping her insanely as she smiled yet still seemed removed. Onision decided to skip college, or maybe had to because of his GPA, and spent time continuing to develop his websites. Did I manage all those websites? I spent like most of my time watching South Park and managing message boards. The same year that Onision met Sky, he developed the website Mr. Odd, which was like almost all of his other websites, just a way for him to put his thoughts into basically a website diary. But in 2004, Onision updated the Mr. Odd website to include videos and began to host some of his early content before YouTube. This cute and sweet little video was created by... Mr. Odd.com <clears throat> Thank you, Davey Dacry, for sending me the request to list three embarrassing moments in my life. Instead of saying what they are, I want to show you the embarrassing moments in my life by reenacting them. <laughs>
most of this content was literally him and Sky playing with dolls. But it didn't seem like the website building life ended up where Onision had hoped, and Onision decided to join the Air Force to get his life in gear financially in January of 2005. In May of 2005, Greg and Skye became engaged. Greg stated that before their marriage, he asked Skye to sign a prenup, and she cried. That what's mine is mine, and what's hers is hers. If I bought it, it's mine. If she bought it, it's hers. If it's a gift that was given to her, it's hers. If it was a gift that was given to me, it's mine. That's the agreement I was trying to get before we ever got married, but when I attempted to get that agreement back then, she sobbed hysterically saying that I didn't really love her. Because for some reason, she is interested in me and my possessions and not just me. Now uses this incident as evidence of his claim that Sky put on waterworks because she was interested in his money. I asked for a prenuptial agreement when we first talked about getting married. And as a result, the other person cried. They said that I must not really love them if I want to get a prenuptial agreement. She also had a very obvious interest in her own financial benefit. Now, with that being said, once I requested that we get a divorce, she later decided to pursue me for money, which brings us back to that whole prenuptial thing. Wow, now I see why you turned on the waterworks. Because, yeah, privates or E1s in the military have so much money that you really need a prenup. I know people in the military joke about partners who are interested in that BAH money, but if you literally wrote about joining the military to get your life in gear financially, why would someone be with you for your money? That makes no sense. Greg also created the website America's Air Force during his time in the Air Force to chronicle his life as an airman. Greg has claimed about his time in the Air Force that he joined there but dropped out because they asked him to kill a rabbit. But according to a source, a lot of his claims of his time in the Air Force may not be truthful, even though he says he's the most honest YouTuber. Who would have ever guessed? Found this little nugget of gold on Twitter. I was in the US Army during the period Onision was in the USAF. I actually met USAF Security Force Airmen that were in the same unit as Onision, and they told me Onision was a wimp who'd throw a tantrum anytime he was told to do something he didn't want to do. His story about failing out of Sarah for not killing a rabbit was BS, and he made up that excuse to cover the fact he broke down and started crying during a ruck march because he was too weak to keep up the pace. He's a narcissist that can't handle even the tiniest iota of criticism because it conflicts with his mental image of being such a badass. His ego can't handle the cognitive dissonance he feels when he's forced to face the fact that he's a fragile man baby, and that self-actualization overwhelms him. It's pretty pathetic to watch his sub-100 IQ try to rationalize his abject failure and manipulate the whole situation in a way that convinces him he came out on top. Basically, though Greg continually claims he was too ethical and moral to be in the Air Force, others who were in the service with him, alongside other military members, say that Greg was actually someone who wasn't able to mentally handle the pressure and would often break down and have tantrums. After quitting the SAIR school, Greg applied for security police, and before training commenced, Greg and Skye married in August 2005 in San Antonio, Texas. While in the military, Greg continued to work on his websites, and towards the end of 2005, Greg made his final alias change in the website Onision Productions. In 2004, Greg was going by Onison and Unision, and in 2005, he went by Onision, which was basically just a combination of his two previous aliases. Throughout the early years of using Onision online, Greg gave several explanations of the meaning of the word. In 2005, he said, You will not find the word anywhere but where I have placed it. It's me. It's original. It's exciting. Odd. Frightful. Deep. Honorable. Harsh. Mighty. Strong. It's something no one can be, but he who created it. It is I, Gregory. 
J. Not one person can say a greater word to my ear. To the world, it is worthless. To my world, it is all that truly matters, as long as my soul burns. When Gregory began pursuing a career on YouTube, he began talking about an Onision revolution and began breaking down the word Onision as Oni, meaning one, and Sion, meaning divine community. The Onision revolution is about making the world a better place, both through laughter and by spreading a message of peace. You will find I'm often conflicting with my own beliefs if you view them from afar. I'm against harming others in every aspect, and yet my sense of humor finds the topic to be humorous when it is hypothetical. And Onision started producing content on his Onision Productions website to get the revolution going. Although as Gregory himself pointed out his idea of the word Onision was often very contradictory to the content he produced itself, which was very harsh and mean-spirited in its comedic content. Okay, so I shouldn't say anything about your uh, weight problem because I have never had a weight problem myself. That's your argument. I think being fat and uh, being sick, etc is ridiculous. So even though Onision claimed he wanted to start this revolution of divine oneness and community... I should talk more about Earth. I mean, if you guys have something you want me to talk about specifically about Earth, please, onision.net slash contact, and if it's something that I feel I can actually um, help with, something I can actually um, create change, by speaking about. He often picked people apart online in mean-spirited ways, so there's a very strange cognitive dissonance almost immediately going on with Onision's mentality and the way that he produced content online. What's up, guys? Today I want to do a video on uh, why are people so stupid? Pretty, the... not pretty. But in the second photo they submitted, prettier. Semi-pretty. Cute. Mm, not pretty. Semi-pretty. Not pretty. Not pretty. Semi-pretty. Kinda pretty. Kinda. The lower end of semi-pretty, like almost not semi-pretty. You! Why did you post the picture? Why? Stop it. Along with his Onision's Productions website, early on, Greg inconsistently posted YouTube videos, but would often delete videos that he didn't like. In fact, almost all of Onision's videos from 2006 have been either privated or deleted. But while Onision was focused on his brand and production website, he was still in the military and going through what seems to be some personal life struggles and, well, struggles in making friends. In January of 2007, Onision wrote a long blog post explaining why he decided that he and Sky were going to stop hanging out with friends completely and only hang out with each other and family. Three days later, two mutual friends of Greg and Sky's tried to separate them because they believed that Greg was bad for Sky. Greg wrote an entry about this titled, You Hate Others for the Love of Drama. I was going to post something extremely long about how upset I am with two people I know within my personal life who are continuously trying to break my wife and I apart physically and vocally, but I'm not going to as I believe it can only cause a greater level of drama, which is exactly what they feed on. In fact, they probably know I'm talking about them right now and are dialing my number just to tell me and others how wrong I am for my wife. And somehow, by saying I love her every hour of the day, feeding her full of yummy food, trying to make her happy emotionally in other ways, putting a roof over her head, that and a result of that, I'm a bad husband. I'm sure you'll continue to call and harass us with drama, but just know, the world as you see it is different on the other end. We're happy alone. So happy. I love my wife so much, and you're trying to cut us apart, both of you. For that, I should say more, but I won't. Not now. Not another moment wasted on you. It's important to note that isolation is a powerful tactic used by controlling partners. And there's many ways in which a controlling partner will isolate their partner from their friends, family, and loved ones. After over a year of volunteering and not being deployed, Greg was informed that he would be deployed to South Korea, stationed slash deployment from what I understand. Prior to deployment, Greg noted struggling to find 
find purpose in life, spending most of his off time playing video games. Greg was stationed at Osan Air Force Base in South Korea, but he resented his time there and experienced such turmoil that only a few months after deployment, he attempted to end his life but decided to not go through with it. In January of 2010, Greg uploaded the video, I Am Fallen. He says that November 14th of 2007 was the day he tried to end his life. A lot of you have been giving me feedback saying that you respect me for standing up for what I believe in, that you think I'm brave for fighting so passionately for the lives of those I care for and those I love. I want to let you in on a little secret. It's not that I'm brave. It's that I'm dead. November 14th, 2007, I had a nine minutes to my skull. I've changed as a person since that day. Because now I feel like no matter what happens to me, I made it way further than I should have. So when you guys call me brave, remember you're just talking to a ghost. I will continue to fight for others so they don't end up like me. This was the first time that Greg mentioned this story to his YouTube fans. And if you pay attention to the words that Greg says in this video, it again identifies a pattern of self-victimization alongside an identity of saviorism, a strange duality coexisting in the way that Onision tried to portray himself to the world. He acted as if the world was always harming him, and yet simultaneously that he was the hero to his own story, who was going to save and help everyone. Who do you think they're going to choose? The person who attempted to kill someone or the person who decided this is wrong. I'm not going to participate. It's up to you. It depends on what you believe, of course, but you could be damning yourself for all eternity. You worship your laws, your documents, your machine. Something that has an allegiance with you only if you agree with it. In your agreement lies no benefit, but in your disagreement lies punishment. I wish upon you life. I wish your family happiness. However, to you I remain your enemy because our philosophies do not align exactly. After his breakdown, Greg was given 30 days of leave. And when he returned, Greg filed for conscientious objector status so that he could be discharged from the Air Force. A couple months later, now in 2008, in a fit of frustration and still waiting for his status to be approved, Greg stripped down in his boss's office to prove that he's human and not a machine. I am a human being equivalent to you, mother So I got down in my birthday suit. I'm a f***ing human being, so I'm gonna strip in my birthday suit. So I got down in my birthday suit and um, I'm completely naked. Like a lot of the, the rumor around the squadron was that I just got down in my underwear. No. I took off my underwear too. I was completely naked, standing at parade rest in front of a chief master sergeant and the senior airman who me. And this stunt earned him 10 minutes of jail time. Fortunately, Greg had YouTube to balance out the negatives in his life. Whether it be placebo effect, or whether it be tulpa, some kind of entity created specifically just to harm me. I need your help. You must counter this force with positive thought. So please, think of me living forever. And Greg surpassed 100 subscribers in the early months of 2008. And in 2008, Onision started his I'm So series, where he made several music videos about various subcultures of society. I'm so deep. I'm so gothic. These videos didn't hit the algorithm until his gamer song, I'm So Music Video. I'm so gamer. I'm so TV. I like Pac-Man. Pokemon. I'm so Tetris. 
On July 15th of 2008, in just one week, the video garnered 630,000 views, which is pretty big for that time period. But the video received mixed reception from viewers. Some expressed their dislike for the video, calling Onision corny and creepy, while others seemed to like the video. And throughout this time, Onision was still trying to get fired from the military. So Greg uploaded the video, I'm so machine. I'm so machine. I'm so heroic. Another song in his I'm So series that criticized the US military, probably hoping that making this video would cause him to get kicked out of the military. The I'm So Death Machine video description reads, a anti-war song about the military and Anything said negative is not directed at any country, but more specifically, the governments and armies of countries. Please refrain from flaming this video. Whatever you have to say about me, you likely do not have the information one would need in order to pass judgment you have in your mind. I hope this opens some eyes and closes no positive doors. I wish the best for the world, and yet I'm not willing to condone any kind of violence. This is just my stand and is non-negotiable. The day after uploading I'm So Death Machine, Greg wrote a blog post about how the video was forwarded to his boss just as he expected. He complains that his work doesn't realize that he's doing more damage than good and that they've fired screw-ups before, but when he asked to be let go with no screw-ups on his record, they instead torture him with meaningless tasks and a paycheck he doesn't need. Eight months after applying for the conscientious objector status, Greg was finally discharged, and Greg claims he had a meltdown on his way out after he was instructed to pay for a microwave that he never used. He allegedly went caveman and yelled at two sergeants. On the way out, where uh, they were saying, <laughs> this tech sergeant and the staff sergeant were like, well, you gotta pay for this microwave. Let's get f***ing raw. Let's get f***ing tribal. Let's get f***ing caveman over here, okay? I am a human being equivalent to you, mother -fucker. So I was like, um, I was like, do you know why I'm getting kicked out of the military? It's because I hate motherfuckers like you. After Greg was discharged from the Air Force, Greg and Skye moved back to Washington to live with Greg's mother while trying to find a house. In a video titled, Onision's High School Classmate Comes Forward, full video reaction by Onision, Greg revealed an incident where Skye was crying as his mother laughed and screamed in her face. He claimed it was due to Skye not wanting to help around the house. My mother and I never had a great relationship. Ever. My mother, in fact, at one point when Sky was crying, screamed in Sky's face and laughed at her. Just like my mom used to scream at me and laugh at me when I cried as a child. This really happened. It was because Sky didn't want to do chores around the house because, as I said, Sky was not necessarily the most. Sky would sit on the computer and stare at images of flowers all day. After the military, Greg began to seriously pursue his YouTube career, and Sky was working out of the house and supporting both of them, while Gregory stayed home and worked on building his YouTube channel. And then when Greg's channel became successful enough to financially support them both, Greg asked Sky to quit her job and work for the YouTube channel with him full time. By the end of 2008, Onision's channel had grown to nearly 10,000 subscribers. And on Onision's main channel, he uploaded mainly comedic skits with the fictional character Chibi. Ram, 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 ram. Oh, hi! My name is Chibi Derp and I'm here to teach you about painting. Ram, 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 ram. Who was a parody of the character Fred Figglehorn, who dominated the YouTube platform at that time, if you remember. Onision's earliest controversy came in April of 2009 when he uploaded a video titled Murder eaters about his stance on vegetarianism. He told his audience to unsubscribe if they didn't agree with his viewpoint and agreed with comments that labeled him self-righteous because he doesn't 
or anything. Well, let's see here. We're living beings and we like being alive, right? So if we kill other beings that probably like being alive, hmm, that's not really something that we have to debate now, is it? Oh, wait. Yes, it is because you guys are morons. He also uploaded the video, We Moo You Mur another video about his stance on vegetarianism where he dressed up like a cow no limitation to how evil you human beings can be is there because you grew up consuming meat you never questioned it because your family thinks it's okay your friends think it's okay of course why wouldn't you think the same thing something tells me you're not special you're not unique in fact you're not strong-willed or even remotely aware of the things going on outside your fictional world out of sight out of mind. Thousands die every day. Onision was clearly becoming very comfortable on the YouTube platform with his true personality beginning to show. He would berate anyone who opposed his opinions and would guilt trip people into following his ideologies. And unlike the websites that Onision developed during his teen years, he had zero control on the feedback he would receive on YouTube. So for the first time in his life, Greg was being bombarded by by people with opposing views. And this included fellow content creators who would upload videos criticizing Onision for his approach and viewpoints. Because he can't cope with opposing views. Because he can't have an open conversation. He filed a false DMCA claim. And in response, Greg would file several DMCA takedown requests to silence those who didn't agree with him. While this rightfully upset many content creators online, it went unnoticed by the larger YouTube audience. And Onision's consistent upload schedule continued to pay off. And in August of 2009, he grew to 28,000 subscribers and created his second channel called Onision Speaks, where he would upload commentary videos. And Onision's popularity only increased when he began collaborating with fellow content creator Shane Dawson. At the time, viewers were consistently comparing Onision with Shane Dawson on the platform, mainly because the two uploaded pretty similar content, which is basically just problematic comedy skits. In November of 2009, Onision uploaded a video titled Shane Dawson No. Not as good as the last Last one, you say? <laughs> Midway through the video, Onision says, Hey, look, everybody, I have long hair and I'm white. I must be Shane Dawson because we're all racist a holes. I must be Shane Dawson because we're all racist a holes. Or maybe you guys actually do look alike. In December, Shane reached out to Greg after seeing his videos and the two decided to collaborate. Onision uploaded the video Dawson's Freak and then they uploaded two collab videos onto their channels. One where Greg pretended to be a Shane Dawson impersonator and another video titled Shane Dawson Fanboy Love where Greg pretended to be an obsessed fanboy who paid Shane to appear in his video. Early 2000s YouTube is a fever dream, I swear. But this collaboration helped skyrocket Onision's channel and skyrocketed his subscriber count, putting him on the map in the YouTube community. And in the span of two months, Onision gained 100,000 subscribers subscribers. Onision quickly expanded his online presence and introduced merch to his channel. But this was only the beginning. Onision had a viral video called Banana Song, I'm a Banana. Guys! What, Greg? I'm a banana! You're a what? I'm a banana! What happened to your clothes? I'm a which appeared on the Comedy Central show Tosh.0 as the viewer video of the week. What'd you say? I'm a banana! At one stage, Tosh.0 reached number one ratings for its time slot among men aged 18 to 24. This specific appearance on season two, episode four, is credited with giving Greg a huge boost in popularity and helping him reach YouTube fame. And the Banana Song went on to accumulate over 93 million views. You'd think at this point, Onision would be pretty happy, right? He had a booming platform, a house. He was out of the military and home with his wife. Onision wanted more. He would continue to chat with his fans 
and crossed multiple boundaries, and eventually stumbled onto a fan named Shiloh, who was marked as his next victim. Shiloh was born in Abbotsford, British Columbia, and from the age of seven, she entered multiple singing competitions. Eventually, Shiloh traveled to Vancouver to work with songwriting and production team Hip Joint Productions, who wrote and produced seven songs on her debut album, Picture Imperfect, including the Canadian platinum selling single, Operator, A Girl Like Me. Shiloh signed to Universal Music Canada in 2008 and Universal Republic in early 2009. Canadian pop star Shiloh with us, who has had a number of hits over the years, started in the business very young, um, double platinum, a uh, great career. And her single, Operator, A Girl Like Me, skyrocketed Shiloh's profile, resulting in her being listed as Billboard Canada's number one emerging talent artist. Out of all the people who viewed Onision's banana video on Tosh.0 was the 16-year-old singer Shiloh. And then she met Onision. After binging through his content, Shiloh emailed Greg in April of 2010. Shiloh saw my banana video on TV. Anyway, so that's the story, guys. Uh, that's that's what happened. She, she found me. I love you. I love you. I love you. I Shiloh was asking Greg for advice because she was in a bad relationship. According to Shiloh, Greg only responded to her email after he learned about her celebrity status. At the time, Greg considered himself a celebrity due to all of his televised appearances and likely reached out to Shiloh hoping that she would increase his profile. And Shiloh claims that they talked for 8 months every day, around 8 to 10 hours a day. It was between like January and December of 2011. Um, and we, we ended up talking about like pretty much all day, all of the waking hours. Um, it was starting to bother my mother a lot. Uh, it took me away from my work a lot. And around this time, Greg's YouTube channel was growing rapidly, having accumulated over 250,000 subscribers and reaching YouTube's top 100 most subscribed list. Sky, Greg's wife at the time, assumed that Greg just had a mentor relationship with Shiloh until it became obsessive. Although Greg was already 25, his friendship with Shiloh slowly became an emotional affair. And after months and months of contact with Shiloh, Greg began to contemplate leaving Skye, his wife. He threatened to divorce Skye in June of 2010 after Skye stated that because of their marriage and all of her work on their YouTube channel, that she owned half of Greg's assets. After she said this, Greg allegedly wrote up a divorce contract, which he gave to Skye in December of 2010. Um, I signed a contract with Skye on the 22nd of December stating that she was entitled to live in this home for two years so long as she didn't cause any disruptions uh, with free rents, um, free food, free water, free electricity, etc. But it also stated that the home was completely forfeited to me, meaning I own this place now um, because she signed the document saying so. The document also stated that if she chose not to live in this home that I would give her $1,000 every single month for up to a year. And I think it also stated that uh, it'll never exceed 30% of my income just in case for some reason I cannot afford $1,000 a month. This is how Sky describes the incident. When he initially came to me with the divorce papers, it came out of nowhere. He had been talking to Shiloh off and on, and she would sometimes be on Skype in the background. I thought he was mentoring a kid and giving them advice on videos, so it wasn't troubling at first. Then he got obsessive. After this, he took me aside one night and told me the following, I'm going to divorce you because I've finally found real happiness. I never loved you and was just afraid of being alone. If you want me to be happy, you'll let me do what I want. Upon which I clearly remember the look on his face, cold as a lizard on ice, dead-eyed, and with a smirk. 
He picks up his phone, calls Shiloh, and says, it's done now, now we can be together. Turns and walks away, locking himself in his room. The next day, looking like he was high on his own supply, he came to me in the afternoon having printed out a divorce document demanding I sign it. He would proceed to follow me around the house for hours at a time, screaming at me that if I really loved him, I would sign the paperwork. Eventually, after the endless onslaught, I gave in as my spirit was quite broken. He still refused used to let me use our phone. She clearly says this was not a mutual decision. And she says we didn't have any prior discussions. I came in one day and told her to sign them. There was no discussion. It was clear that I had to sign them or else. Or else what? You have to be specific. Or else what? He made it very clear to me that I had no choice other than to sign the papers that he presented to me. What does that mean? You have to be specific. Was he stroking a snake that looked hungry and desperate to attack a human? What is or else? I go no contact. I go through my lawyers and keep seeing my counselor. I get a job to pay for the lawyers and borrow money from my family to retain them. As proceedings go along, the court determines that the initial contract he made me sign is null because all of the above. Proven through my counselor, verifying my mental state and the fact that it wasn't notarized proper, etc. According to Shiloh, Greg showed her the divorce papers over Skype and told her he loved her for the first time. Shiloh was 17 and Greg was 25. Guy and I separated for a very very good reasons, okay? We were going to divorce multiple times prior to us actually divorcing. The thing is, is that everything was kind of okay right before we divorced or whatever. Um, like, things were getting repaired, but then I just, I had my limit because she freaked out, like, got really emotional for valid reasons, and um, I was being a dumbass for not valid reasons. I was just focusing on, on, you know, making Shiloh's life better. You know, making her feel better about her life. Not a lot of people just tell you everything pretty much about their lives like I do. And I think that's because they have a lot more respect for the people around them than I do. I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? Um, I'm all about letting everyone know what's going on in my life and sometimes stories about other people get into that. And Greg quickly after announced his separation from Sky to his YouTube audience. Hey guys. Um... Something has happened as of late, and I think that all of you should know that it happened because a lot of you have a significant investment in my life and Scott's life. She and I have decided to get a divorce. We were married for five years, and now it's over. So I'm moving on, and I hope that she moves on soon, too. The weird contract that Greg drafted up was eventually thrown out and was replaced with traditional divorce papers. Sky initially demanded an alimony payment of $150,000, but Sky and Greg settled out of court for $90,000. Even though over the next few years, Greg would make multiple videos attacking Sky for this alimony payment and trying everything he possibly could to get her to go back on making him pay this alimony payment. Once I requested that we get a divorce, she later decided to pursue me for money. Anyway, here they say one of their expenses is a counselor, which they didn't need while we were together. But I guess someone saying I want a divorce could be pretty traumatic. Listing utility expenses, all these other random expenses. Thank goodness we didn't have children together. Damn, that's some good health care. I am requesting, according to my financial declaration, relatively nominal support. I, however, do believe that as a result of the business that we have created, we did not create create the business. Literally, this person watched me do it by myself. Occasionally, I would ask them to act in videos. Act. And they say that they're entitled to a share of the profits. Oh my god, this is why I wanted a prenup. But they cried, so I felt bad. It's because I care that I'm screwed. Nice guys finish last. Shortly after my husband served me with divorce papers, I do have expenses for counseling due to the aftermath of my marriage. AKA, I left them and they needed to talk to a therapist because I left them. Finally free from his marriage, Onision drove to Pennsylvania on December 27th, 2010 to meet Shiloh, who is currently 17 years old, for the first time. He chose Pennsylvania because of its lowered age of consent laws, but while driving through Montana, Greg accidentally hit and killed a deer, which supposedly went against his beliefs of never harming a living creature. But also, it totaled his car so he couldn't drive the rest of the way to meet Shiloh in Pennsylvania.
Hey guys, Onision here, uh, the vegetarian. Um, yeah, I just hit a deer back there. Uh, that kind of sucks a lot. My car is totaled. I'm still driving because I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Hopefully it doesn't explode or something. But I'm just letting you guys know that this kind of changes things a little bit. Because I was planning on making a video today, but uh, my car is totaled. So I need to go buy a new friggin' car. And uh, there's some deer back there and like a billion pieces. So because his car was totaled, Greg bought a ticket for a flight and flew the remaining distance to Pennsylvania. Immediately upon entering the hotel room, Greg kisses Shiloh and the two have inter- He shows up at this hotel room in Pennsylvania. I was staying in the hotel by myself. He made his way to PA. Um, before he made his way there, he had explained to me that we could get in a lot of trouble. Because Into a lot of trouble. Yeah, he explained to me we could get in a lot of trouble and that he had to check the state laws before he came. Because of your age? Because he knew we were going to stick together and we had spoken about that. And when he showed up, he started kissing me immediately um, and we stuck together within like five minutes. Afterward, Greg sets up his recording equipment and makes a short one minute video about him the deer. The importance of this video is that in the background you can hear Shiloh giggling. Mom's house. <laughs> <Dead>. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> Shiloh eventually talked about her relationship with Greg on Facebook, and she mentioned that on December 28th of 2010, her and Greg had sex in a state where it was legal. And at that time, Shiloh was in a weight loss boot camp program in Pennsylvania. Sue, it's ready with the flip cap. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Good job. What's even more disturbing is that while Shiloh and Greg were together in Pennsylvania, Shiloh's mom notified the hotel of Greg's presence. The hotel staff grew suspicious of an older man locked in a room with a minor and eventually called the authorities. When the police arrived, they questioned why Greg had camera equipment set up, likely assuming that Greg was recording CP content with Shiloh. So the police took their time looking through Greg's computer for any illegal content and further questioned why he was with a minor. Unable to find any evidence, the police sent Shiloh back home to Canada and Greg home to Tacoma, Washington. He actually had the police called while we were there. His computer was checked for um, uh, child pictures. Okay. Yes, and then they left because there was nothing. Um, they made me go home, back to Canada, and they made him go home, back to Seattle. And roughly two weeks before Shiloh's 18th birthday, Greg introduced his audience to Shiloh on April 12th of 2011. Hey guys, as I'm sure you know, because I'm incredibly famous, and I wanted you to meet my girlfriend, so... I'm, I'm Onisio, and I, wear, I like to wear makeup and skinny jeans. <laughs> there she is! Say hi! <laughs> Oh, All right, all about so, so that's enough of her. Question of the day. <laughs> so tell us something about yourself. Uh, no. And on the day that Greg uploaded their relationship announcement, Shiloh created a new YouTube channel called Draculo. Hi, I'm Shiloh. Let me tell you something about myself. I have arms and legs! Isn't that horrible? I stepped on a nail! Uh, no! Oh my god! <laughs> buddy! At this time, Greg and Shiloh were living in an apartment together in Canada, waiting for Shiloh to turn 18. Then, as soon as Shiloh turned 18, they moved in together into Greg's Washington home. Um, so December 2011 is when we were in PA. He was with me in Toronto by January. Um, and he was living in Toronto? Yep, he got an apartment. We were living right on Yonge Street. 
<laughs> right in Toronto. Right. According to Shiloh, they moved in together after Shiloh's 18th birthday because she couldn't leave the country prior without her mother's written consent. She also claimed that Greg manipulated her into cutting off her parents from her life. Shiloh says she spent the night of her 18th birthday in a hotel so that Greg could fly her out the next morning. We moved to Seattle um, the day before I turned 18. We were in the hotel waiting. Morning I turned 18, we were off to Seattle. That took me away from all of my network, really which does not sound like the best birthday. And Greg began completely isolating Shiloh the same way he isolated Skye. Once Shiloh was in Washington, she left behind her family, her home, her friends, even her management, resulting in her being dropped from her management. She effectively lost the music career that she'd worked to build up. Eventually, I was not able to contact my management. I got dropped from my management and was away from her family and all sense of familiarity, which sounds like such a stressful and scary experience, especially if you worked through so much of your childhood to build up a music career and then basically lose it all overnight after chasing a relationship. And how did Shiloh cope with this? It seems like Shiloh coped with this through immersing herself more and more into Gregory's life, getting a Gregory tattoo on the back of her neck. Greg claims that he never asked her to get his name tatted. I didn't ask her to get that tattoo. She actually surprised me with it and I was kind of overwhelmed by it because believe it or not, I've never asked anyone to tattoo Greg or anything like Greg on their body. I did ask another person to get a Lily tattoo, but that again has nothing to do with me. In fact, Greg once claimed that he was against tattoos, though he claims that Shiloh was the person who changed his mind on that. On June 21st of 2011, Shiloh wrote on her blog that she was going to get inked with Greg within the next few days. But two days later, Greg uploaded the video, Shiloh Forgot Me. In the video, Greg says he couldn't upload a video that day due to a strange episode Shiloh had after a fight. This video is going to explain exactly what happened. I just want you guys to know that I will be uploading a new comedy sketch on Saturday. And thank you for bearing with me through all this. Thanks. Then Greg shows footage of him filming Shiloh as she's having what appears to be a seizure. Shiloh's laying in the bed and is repeating seemingly random and childish phrases such as, I want to make a rainbow. Later, Greg decides to edit a video while recording himself, and Shiloh wakes up afraid of him. Apparently, Gregory did not call the ambulance while she was passed out during this time and decided to instead just edit a video in the meantime. And Greg and Shiloh figure out that Shiloh lost three years of her memory. After filming themselves catching up, looking at friends and family members' photos on Facebook, Gregory reminded Shiloh that she was vegetarian and gave her vegan cheese. How's the vegan cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, people were upset at this video for a number of reasons. First off, for Gregory's decision to not seek medical assistance. Many people questioned whether or not this video was real or staged, and the implications of that could be spreading misinformation on what to do in general because you don't just let someone lie there and struggle with a seizure. You make sure they have medical help. Other criticisms were that Greg was exploiting and profiting off of another person's illness. Another weird thing was 
was Greg's weird focus on trying to make sure that Shiloh remembered that she was a vegetarian. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's interesting that even with years of her memory wiped for that moment, her brain still immediately perceived Onision as a threat. Even in that state, she was so traumatized, her brain still knew that Onision was a threat. It's heartbreaking. The fact that she was back in the mind of herself at 15 years old just tells how serious and severe the trauma was. She was basically back to her mind before being with him. Last night, I lost three years of my memory. I woke up to a strange man who I now know as Greg, thinking I was hurt or violated. I did not know where I was or who I was. Before, Greg showed me proof that I had been with him for this long, and he wasn't there to hurt me. Later that night, I felt close to him, like I had feelings for him. I feel love for him. That's something I remember. You had a medical seizure at one point during your relationship with him. He left me crying hyperventilating, actually, because I was very distraught. In the shower, he left me there. Um, and things started to get really crazy. So, like, I felt all of these tingles in my face, and I'm really hyperventilating, and then I just kind of conked out in there. Now, in between the time of how I got from there to beside his desk, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but that was a grand mal seizure from what I know. Um, and it took memory from me. Uh, I woke up not knowing who he was. I had lost a good three years and I, I've been having seizures ever since, to be really honest with you. According to Shiloh, her memory started to come back, and despite this very traumatic incident, Greg and Shiloh continued to stay together and continued to post content onto YouTube. And on June 30th of 2011, Shiloh uploaded a video titled Bald. The next day, Shiloh uploaded her blog with a blog post titled Being Bald. In the post, she confesses that shaving the rest of her hair made her deeply depressed. She says she made a stupid decision, but guesses that being bald will give her a fresh start with her hair. This initially didn't cause any controversy until Shiloh eventually came forward to say that Greg had actually forced her to shave her head in their relationship and told her, I want you to shave your head because you're a good bitch. She says that Greg took her to the bathroom and he shaved her head, and Shiloh said she felt ugly and defeminized because of it. He told me, I, I want you to shave your head. And so he took me off into the bathroom and he shaved my head in the tub. That seems controlled, to put it lightly. Yeah, and then, and then he made me do a lot of videos while well, he tried. I think I only got one of them out. He made me do a lot of videos as bald characters, like The Last Airbender. He wanted me to do Lex Luthor. Um, he exploited it. It sounds like he got off on having you essentially end your career while he used you to promote him. Oh, the ultimate submission. And in July of 2011, Shiloh and Greg separated in a massive falling out. It's very unfortunate that I have to broadcast this on my main channel, but I need the message to get out before Shiloh attempts shutting me down completely. 
Shiloh was trying to contact her mother, and Greg called the authorities to their home. When the authorities arrived at their home, Shiloh threatened to end her life, which led them to take her to a mental care facility, where she was finally able to contact her mother and went back home to Canada. I, my mom had come picked me, pick, come and picked me up because he had left right. me in a mental ward at that point. Um, so, so you're shot mentally at this point. Wiped oh, yeah. out. You go, you go to a psychiatric facility or a psychiatric facility in a medical facility, and your yeah. mom comes to get this shell of a young woman. Meanwhile, Gregory abandoned his home and moved in with a friend in LA. Around this time, Greg uploaded a video titled We Broke Up. Hey guys, it's the night of July 4th, which is actually technically the morning of July 5th. I just wanted to let all of you know that Shiloh and I are not together anymore. Um, a lot of you may not have seen this coming. A lot of you may have seen this coming. I don't know. This video began what many viewers viewed as a smear campaign against Shiloh. Greg probably expected that Shiloh was going to expose his abuse throughout their relationship and was attempting to destroy any of her credibility beforehand, while simultaneously weaponizing his fans to harass her. Or it could also be that Greg has an inner need to appear as the victor in all of his relationships, and his attempts at tarnishing Shiloh's name after the breakup was his way of doing so. Following Greg's We Broke Up upload, Shiloh revealed to her Dracula website chat that she and Greg were trying for a baby before their breakup, and she also mentioned there was a possibility that she could be pregnant. Greg's next upload about Shiloh was the video Shiloh Threatened Me, which seemed to be filmed in a hotel room. In the video, Greg claims that Shiloh threatened to hack and destroy him. In the last 24 hours, Shiloh has threatened to destroy me. Destroy being a quote. Shiloh has threatened me in the past in regards to hacking me, in regards to telling people lies about me. He also talks about calling the police on her twice because she was acting hysterical. In the last 48 hours, I've had to call the police on Shiloh twice. Both times, the police officers sided with me, realizing that I was being the reasonable party and that Shiloh was being hysterical. And Greg says that both times the police sided with him. Greg further claims that Shiloh was threatening to lie and tell people he abused her. For the past two days, I've been a prisoner of my own home because of her, because I refused to lift a hand against her. So I just had to stand there and listen to her scream at me and put me in corners. And afterward, Greg uploaded the truth, which included footage that he recorded before he and Shiloh separated. After some debate about the appropriate level of what clips to show from the video The Truth, where Shiloh is extremely upset and even yelling to get the camera off me, it's been decided that this video will not feature any clips from Greg's video because it's clear, at least in my opinion, that Shiloh was not consenting to being filmed. Instead, I thought it may be helpful here for context to provide some clips of a psychologist from the channel Live Abuse Free analyzing that video and the harm of Greg's actions and why it was so dangerous and toxic. I think I can make out a slight smile on his face and I think that's because he feels confident that he's coming across as calm and her um, emotional reaction is making her look a little bit mad. I think that's what he thinks as, and he knows that he's filming this. So it looks like a victorious little smile to me. The video starts out with the text, in the last 24 hours, I've been publicly slandered by my ex. The time for talking is over. Decide for yourself who is right. It then cuts to Greg holding the camera to his face while we hear Shiloh crying and talking on the phone in the background. <laughs> 
She says she wants to be able to talk because she feels like she can't be heard by anyone. She seems really desperate. That's how someone can be when they've been ignored, when somebody has ignored them and dismissed them over and over and over again. And she's saying that, that she's talking about how what he says isn't true. So that that's referring to, I think, a smear campaign. She begins yelling, he has a camera on me multiple times. She asks Greg why he has a camera on her. He replies, okay, thank you. She tells him to get the camera off her. Again, he replies, okay, thank you. She doesn't want to be filmed while she's in this state, while she's really vulnerable. She doesn't want his millions of subscribers to see her. And he ignores this boundary. This is the third time she's asked him to stop filming her. And again, he ignores her. His voice sounds really calm. And so he's completely unmoved by her. I think this is really creepy. She tells him to listen and look at her and says, I'm going to seriously tell everybody what you've done to me. He tells her, I haven't done anything to you. And she tells him that he destroyed everything and that she has to go back home and will be kicked out and that she is nothing. I believe that he thinks he's coming across as really sane. In my opinion, he's coming across as quite unhinged because he just has no feeling while she's going through this. He certainly doesn't show any feeling. He's repeatedly ignoring this boundary. You know, she, he, he's completely ignoring that she doesn't want to be filmed and he's just doing it because that's what he wants to do. And he's doing this for, in my opinion, for narcissistic supply because he's made this video to get everybody to validate him and tell him what a great guy he is. He's in the right and what a crazy girlfriend he's got. The screen fades to black with the text, the cops show up minutes later. It what would you like us to do, sir? You call. Um, I called my sister and she told me to just leave, to just move away. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a good idea. Yeah. The video did not have the intended results that Greg was after and was met with immediate outrage. Most viewers sympathized with Shiloh, meaning Greg's intentions for uploading the video backfired, causing Greg to delete the video. I'm not a mental health professional, but in my opinion and from my research and knowledge in this, oftentimes when Onision overplays the position of the victim to the public and hyper focuses on the actions of the other person, particularly in moments of high stress, mental instability, or when the other person is breaking down or just at their breaking point, this is an example of reactive and how this tactic works. According to impactforwomen.org, one of the most common tactics abusers use is to shift blame for the abuse onto the victim. The abuser will claim the victim is the abuser because of the reaction the victim has. What if I'm the one that is in the wrong? What if this is my fault? Because everything was turned around to be a problem with me. I was the cause for everything. There was no... Greg did something wrong. You were the one victimized here. Yet, to Onision's followers, you were the bad guy? You were attacked? Oh, he smeared me as much as he possibly could. Reactive abuse occurs when the victim reacts to the abuse they are experiencing. The victim may scream, toss out insults, or even lash out physically to the abuse. The abuser then retaliates by telling the victim that they are, in fact, the abuser. Abusers rely on this reactive abuse because it's their proof that the victim is unstable and mentally ill. The abuser will hold these reactions against the victim indefinitely. Sometimes abusers use this reaction as an excuse to go to the police or even file for protective orders of their own. When asked about the truth in a 2011 live chat, Greg said he uploaded that video to prove to the viewers that what he said in the Shiloh Threaten Me video was true and that Shiloh was unstable, but that when the majority of viewers hated the video and were sympathizing with her, he deleted the video. Here's the thing is she was, she, she publicly said something that was really, really hurtful to me. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna say something publicly really, really hurtful to me that makes me look bad. Okay, well, here's the video of what really happened. Oh, you know what? It, no, it wasn't. I uploaded it and um, what happened was, is people really hated it. They were totally siding with her. And I was like, wait, did I make a mistake? Because everybody was all just totally siding with her. I was like, why, 
why is everyone siding with her? I thought I was right. And so then I took it down and I was like thinking about it. I was like, I, I couldn't figure out for the longest time why everyone was siding with her. Greg said he regretted putting out the footage, but that it was out there so there was no going back. Anyway, uh, it was a mistake obviously to ever release that footage and it's something that I regret, but it's out there and there's no going back. And then, in the midst of all the drama with Shiloh, Greg sent a message to his ex-wife Skye, demanding she does not make any decisions without talking to him first, saying he's just really confused right now, totally lost. It's possible he needed someone to validate him after getting so much negative backlash from his experiences with Shiloh, and would have probably used Skye to make himself look good and further invalidate Shiloh. In late July of 2011, Shiloh made a blog post titled Winner, where she details out her side of the relationship. She said she wants people to know what really happened and doesn't want people to think that she's crazy. She also states she was not put in a mental hospital, but a domestic recovery crisis center. The following is an extremely shortened and condensed version of what was in the blog post. Shiloh claimed that Gregory would constantly complain about her body. She said one time she was having heart problems in the shower and Gregory leaned down and asked her if she was sorry for what she did. When she would ask for help with her heart problems, Gregory would tell her, I can't deal with this drama anymore. I'm done. He turned her against her family and friends. He forced her to shave her head. He forcefully went through all of her internet accounts. He found out that she was getting high on Skype, so he threatened to ruin her career by telling everyone. After hearing that, she refused to leave her room because she was so scared that he was going to ruin her life, so he forcefully removed her. So she got hurt, and then he called the cops on her. The next day, he wouldn't listen to her and screamed, get the F out of my house. He called his family members and told them she was crazy, and the cops took her away with a pair of clothes and a piece of paper with her mom's number on it. But while Shiloh was left traumatized from that relationship, all Greg was left feeling was lonely and ready for a new relationship and a new chapter. In August of 2011, Greg had a short-lived relationship with a woman named Adrian. Adrian found Onision through his content, joined his forums, and soon enough they were talking on Skype every night. According to Adrian, Greg asked Adrian to be his girlfriend by the third night of them talking. Adrian claims he begins saying he loved her on night three of them talking and was already talking about marriage and wanting her to move from Texas to live in Los Angeles with him. Talk about as many red flags as possible in one person. Greg posted the video I found her to his Onision Speaks channel where he talks about asking Adrian to be his girlfriend. Hey guys, I hope you don't mind the dark lines under my eyes right now and the fact that I'm a little bit stupid at the moment, more so than usual. It's 5.30 a.m. I've been editing a video all night um, and talking to my new girlfriend on Skype. This relationship would continue in this cycle of very quick breakups and getting back together, all lasting for less than a month until the final breakup, all aired out very publicly online. Hey guys, I am about to make the most pathetic announcement in the history of announcements right now. I'm single again. <laughs> and I laugh because the relationship ended so horrifically. Maybe it's like I'm covering up my tears with a smile right now. It's, it was just awful. <laughs> It was, it was a train wreck. It was the worst. After their final breakup, Greg suggests that Adrian has STDs on his Facebook and Twitter, and Adrian defended herself on a Google Plus post. Adrian and Shiloh briefly became friends after Shiloh read Adrian's Google Plus post about Greg and decided to contact her. Adrian and Shiloh started to publicly mock Greg together on Facebook, mainly for his, at the time, distrust in dating bisexual. 
dual women, which caused some friction in Greg and Adrian's relationship since Adrian was bi. Shiloh also wrote a blog post summarizing the similarities in her story and Adrian's story. But unfortunately, this unity between women wouldn't last, as eventually Shiloh and Greg got back together, and Adrian claims that she believed Shiloh used her to get information out of her to get closer to Greg. Many people wonder why Shiloh went back to Greg, placing blame onto Shiloh for going back into the relationship with him. But the reality is there's a cycle of DV in a relationship that often repeats itself, where oftentimes after an incident, there's a honeymoon phase where the partner will profusely apologize, promise to change, give extravagant gifts or gestures that gives the victim hope that the next time will turn out different, especially if they're younger and more naive. But abusers often don't change their behavior, and the only way out is to leave. The problem is, leaving is often the most dangerous time for a victim of DV. On September 25th of 2011, Shiloh uploaded a video titled STD to her Draculo channel with an identical background to one of Greg's recent videos. People became suspicious, but were completely convinced that the two were back together when Greg uploaded a video titled Shiloh's Back. In the video, they announced their engagement with Shiloh showing off her ring. I'm back. It's like that. During this time, Shiloh had claimed to be pregnant with Greg's child. But about a month before her and Gregory got engaged, Shiloh posted a photo onto Facebook of a premature baby with the caption, In loving memory of Rogue, rest in peace, little man. Once Shiloh and Greg became engaged, someone traced the image Shiloh posted of this premature baby and found out that it was stolen, that this was actually a photo of a young girl who was alive and well. When confronted with this information, Shiloh claimed she had no idea what people were talking about, that she had never seen that picture and had no idea how it was uploaded. The image was removed and she began to deny ever seeing the picture. And Greg made YouTube videos defending Shiloh for uploading a photo of a premature baby that wasn't hers. Shiloh allegedly posting premature baby photos um, and saying it was hers. Um, there's, there's a rumor going around that this happened. There's people who say they witnessed it. And, and quite frankly, I personally don't give a f Okay, and the reason I don't give a f is like if she did that, she immediately removed it after she posted it, okay? So that's kind of like her admitting guilt if she did that, which I don't believe she did that. She told me she didn't do it. Seriously, get a life, get a life. I mean, you're, you're probably like, what, 40 years old, living with your husband, milking him for all his cash, doing nothing all day, watching your Mari and Jerry Springer shows, and then you go online, you're like, oh, whose life can I ruin today? F***ing loser, seriously. Move on, guys. Whatever your, your deal is with Shiloh, drop it. This is old news if it even is news. But only a few months later, Shiloh and Greg announced on October of 2011 that they're expecting again. Through their Facebook fan pages, they each posted photos of a positive pregnancy test. That same day, Greg uploaded a video titled My Girlfriend's Pregnant. The video featured him announcing the pregnancy by ripping his shirt, vomiting on the couch, covering himself in brown liquid, and screaming. But many people were skeptical of this pregnancy. In December, Greg uploaded a video titled Shiloh and Greg Nonfiction. Because viewers were so skeptical about whether or not Shiloh and Greg's drama was real or fake. Hey guys, some my viewers are total f***ing idiots. There are skeptics watching this channel. They think that my life is totally fake. They think that no matter what I say, I'm lying. Because again, they're f***ing idiots. Greg claims they just feel this way because they're biased and hate him because of his views. Because they have a bias. They hate me because I'm a vegetarian. To hate me because I'm against circumcision. To hate me because I'm against r Or to hate me because I'm against most any form of religion that oppresses others. Whatever the reason is, they're so bent on not believing me that they deny what's right in front of them. So he decided to use an event that happened earlier that day to prove that their drama is all real. So let me tell you a story about Shiloh and I, because a lot of people disbelieve anything I say about Shiloh and I. Let me tell you a story about something that happened today while providing images 
to make it undeniable to everybody who's sane watching this that this is indeed factual information. Which, by the way, this event doesn't do. All it does is make me incredibly concerned for Shiloh. Greg starts the story from this day by saying that he and Shiloh were not on good terms. Greg shows footage from his porch security camera. He says Shiloh went to leave the house and dropped the key in the drop slot so he could have the keys and so she could not get back in. This morning, Shiloh and I were not on good terms because I was being stupid, she was being stupid. We were just, we, were, we weren't connecting right, okay? So she left and she put the keys to the house through the drop slot so I would have the keys. And so she, she, she couldn't get back in because she didn't want to get back in. Then Shiloh went for a walk and passed out three miles away from the house. He guessed it was either from stress or exhaustion, but confirmed that Shiloh was okay. She walks three miles down the road and passes out, probably from exhaustion or maybe from stress, who knows? The point is that, that she's okay. I just want to establish that she is okay. The fire department brought Shiloh back to Greg's house to tell him that they were taking her to the hospital. So the, the fire department rolls out and they get her back on her feet and they bring her back here to let me know that they're going to take her to the hospital. The ambulance driver returns to the door to tell Greg to talk to Shiloh in the ambulance because she's refusing treatment. And the ambulance driver comes up to me and asks me to go talk to Shiloh. I go and talk to Shiloh out in the ambulance and, it, and Shiloh refuses medical treatment. As I have said, she always refuses medical treatment when she feels she doesn't need it. Greg claims he just proved everything. He states that he shares all these things so that we, the viewers, can learn from his experiences. This isn't some bullshit reality show. This is real life. There is no director. It's just me and Shiloh. Okay? And the reason we share it with you guys is so you can learn from these things. On December, Shiloh made a Facebook status saying, so we went to go listen to the baby's heartbeat today and she couldn't hear anything. So she did an ultrasound. It's the size of a six week old pregnancy and I'm supposed to be 12 weeks. Greg uploaded the video update on our baby. He explains that the doula could not find a heartbeat and it's safe to assume they lost their baby to a miscarriage. He talks about how they were told to not announce their pregnancy till around 12 weeks, but that they announced it early because they were so excited. So I'm not gonna be a father and um, Shiloh's not gonna be a mother for the time being. Or so it appears. Then things take a dark turn between Greg and Shiloh. Around a week after they announced their miscarriage, Greg uploaded a video titled Shiloh Has Sepsis. Greg states that an infection got into Shiloh's blood and that she needed to be rushed to the hospital in Canada. Hey guys, for the next few days there's not going to be any Anision uploads, which is very abnormal because I've kept to my schedule for years now. Um, I'm just making this video to let you all know that when Shiloh was blood tested in regards to whether or not she was pregnant um, and it concluded that she was going to miscarry, unfortunately, um, results came up that concluded she had sepsis or has sepsis. Now we have to rush her to the hospital in Canada, which she'll be on a plane very soon. So I'm going to spend the remainder of time that Shiloh has here with her rather than editing videos like I normally do. This video was removed from Onision's main channel and uploaded to the Onision Archive channel with an added text stating, I made the mistake of believing a lie. Many viewers felt that this story didn't make much sense, and they also questioned why Greg again didn't take Shiloh to a hospital and instead decided to film, upload, and post a video about the situation. On December 17th, of 2011, Greg uploaded a video titled Goodbye Shiloh, and the video was a montage of his and Shiloh's last day together. And to the skeptics, this video is confirmation that Shiloh didn't have sepsis. Because of all the things that the couple did together, while Shiloh was apparently dealing with a life-threatening infection, like opening Christmas presents, riding a carousel, shopping, and going to an arcade. I'm not a doctor, so I really can't say whether or not someone can do all those things while dealing with sepsis. Then, after taking two days off, Shiloh and Greg returned to the internet 
to see the generally negative reaction to their video, and that's when Greg decided to question whether or not Shiloh was being truthful. I believe that Shiloh was telling the truth when she said she had sepsis. And yet none of us have seen any evidence that she actually does. In 2015, Shiloh explained her side of the story, claiming that after they found out she miscarried, Greg refused to bring her to the hospital to avoid paying health care. Instead, Greg flew her back to Canada, where she was able to receive medical care. Shiloh remained in Canada while Greg flew home. Shiloh and Greg continued to have pretty mixed messages about their relationship status. Sometimes they would act like it's over, other times Greg Greg would announce that Shiloh was going to move back in, only to quickly delete the status or tweet. But by February of 2012, Shiloh and Greg's relationship was officially over. Greg uploaded a music video on February 4th titled It's Over, and this song mostly talks about all the times that Shiloh lied throughout their relationship. I believe your lies give us 14 tries, what do you care? It's not your heart that dies. No, it's me, it's always me. You can lie, control, scream, curse, use, abuse, and I am what am I? I'm another guy. Which again, in my opinion, could be an example of reactive abuse hyper fixating on all the things that Shiloh has done wrong to ensure the official narrative is that she is the abuser and he's the victim. Then a few days after they broke up, Greg found out that Shiloh was with someone new and was clearly outraged by it, writing a lengthy blog post concluding that Shiloh had clearly cheated on him. He uploaded a video titled The Truth Hurts But So Do Your Lies, where Onision said that not only did Shiloh cheat on him, but she also said mean things about him on her Facebook. And this gets thrown on my lap. Oh, by the way, she cheated on you. And then on top of that, she posts things to Facebook saying mean things about me. And it's like, okay, so you cheat on me, you lie to me, and then you say these mean things about me. And I'm just supposed to move on like you never betrayed me. Before this can all be over, I don't want it to all end as if she's somehow the good person in all this. He questioned if she was ever pregnant with his child. She lied to me about being pregnant with our child. She lied about medical conditions. He told Shiloh he wanted his $1,700 back. Shiloh, I want my money back too, by the way. The $300 that I sent you to get your passport to come home, I want that back. And then the other $300 that I sent you to get the passport money, to get the passport because you you lost and or no you got the the first hundred dollars stolen and then spent the other two hundred already, and then the one thousand one hundred dollars I sent you, I want that back too for the rent that you never even used according to your statements. And he begins to dramatically breathe heavier and tells Shiloh to tell her future partners that she's a cheater. And in the future, when you're with somebody else, you better let them know that you're a cheater. <laughs> let, let them know who you are and what you do. <laughs> he announces he's going to do his job now and grasps his chest. I need to go do my job now. So. <laughs> In an attempt to get his money back on February 17th of 2012, Greg arranged to take Shiloh to court on the popular show Judge Judy but the show fell through once the people at Judge Judy realized that Shiloh was not an American citizen. This relationship drama, while at times very messy and annoying for viewers of Onision's channel, 
garnered him a lot of views. You could even say that he profited off of the trauma that was inflicted onto Shiloh. And after the relationship was over, Shiloh's life was fractured, and Shiloh continued to receive an immense amount of harassment and hate because of how much her toxic relationship was publicly aired online. Not only was Shiloh disliked by Onision's fan base, but she was also disliked by the people who were anti Onision's as well. Shiloh was labeled as crazy, a pathological liar. Shortly after the relationship, Shiloh deleted all of her Draculo social medias and channels. Shiloh claims this is because after Greg uploaded his final goodbye video to her, she received around 1,500 messages from his fans, and around 80% of those were people telling her to go unalive herself. 1,500 reaches contacts on social media telling you many of them become yourself. And that's before I shut the account down. I don't, I, I can't even imagine what happened over the last 10 years. For years, many would bash Shiloh in the comments of her old music videos, calling her psycho or mocking her using quotes from her seizure episodes such as, I want to make a rainbow. Shiloh claims she went from making thousands every quarter from her music to $300 a quarter making thousands in my three month quarter that would come out um, to seeing it go to like $300. She claimed that because all the major meltdowns she had in her teenage years were filmed and put onto YouTube by Greg, many people in the music industry saw her as crazy and didn't want to work with her. What did he take from you? Dignity. Not dignity that I haven't gotten back, but dignity, relationships. People did not work with me as much. Uh, I was seen as very crazy. Because everything, every meltdown I had in my teenage years that was, you know, memorable, that I look back and think, wow, that was really something I'll never forget, was recorded. In a live stream, when asked if he felt responsible for the break in Shiloh's music career, Greg said, If you guys want to blame me for that, you can, because I can make a connection as to why Shiloh's no longer singing in my introduction into her life. If I could go back and erase that, give her a future, I would. But the key thing is that she never told me me being in her life was going to risk her career. And she actually said it was the opposite, that everything would be fine. Shiloh has repeatedly communicated that it's my fault that her career didn't work out. So if you guys want to blame me for that, you can. Because I can, I can actually make, I can make a connection as to why Shiloh is no longer singing and my introduction into her life. If I could go back and erase that and give her a future, I would. After witnessing Greg's emotional breakup with Shiloh in late February of 2012, Adrian sent Greg an email. In the email, Adrian says she saw his breakup video and it reminded her of what she went through with one of her exes. She says even though what Greg said about her was hurtful and cruel, she's apologizing for the hurtful things that she said out of anger, offering friendship, and gave him her number. So Onision uploaded the video, Total Victory, where Onision claims that that he has been the good guy in all of his relationships because he was the one that ended all of the relationships that he's been in in the past five years. Hey guys, I'm thinking of calling this video Onision is a great guy or Onision is innocent, something like that, because of the fact that I am. That is that every relationship that has ended in my life in the last two years has been on my terms when it came to the final termination. He also claimed that all of the women that hate him do so only because they were rejected by him. Every single person who has a legitimate problem with me right now, who was formerly a friend or a lover, was dumped by me. That says a lot of good things for all the people who have been supporting me all this time. This is some of the most disgusting, victim-blaming bullshit. I've ever heard in my life. Onision has an obsession over claiming victory over his former love interests, stating he was the victor of these relationships and could not have possibly been the toxic or harmful one simply because he was the one who ended the relationship. If they had such a big problem with me, as they clearly have with me now, why did they stay in the relationship? 
that logic is very seriously flawed and I feel like only works on very immature people or naive people who don't understand the dynamics of relationships whatsoever. It also shows Gregory's inner need to dominate and be above the people within his personal life, which is a trait of NPD, though I will never try and diagnose Onision in this video, but I'ma just put that out there. For the next few years, Greg would continue to talk about his relationship with Shiloh in blog posts and would use his experience with her in comedy videos. There was even one time his mother mocked Shiloh in a sketch video by pretending to have a seizure. Shiloh would also make random brief blog posts about her relationship with Greg, though oftentimes she would delete them afterwards to avoid backlash from Onision's fandom. But when Shiloh found out that Greg was dating a new 17-year-old, she made a longer-than-usual blog post about him. She said he would tell her it was weird that she was so close to her mom, and he had her cut off contact with her dad because he threatened him. She says he didn't want her to talk to her friends back in Canada. She also believes he has a resentment or hate towards women, and she believes this because of his unnatural, sexual, aggressive nature. And one has to wonder where Shiloh would have ended up if she never crossed paths with Greg and was never sucked into his toxic vortex. Shilo is making music again and is undeniably an incredibly talented singer who looks amazing. Shilo has grown and evolved out of the dark shadow of Greg's influence and it's incredible to see and know for all of us out there who have experienced that kind of suffocating, evil relationship that true growth and light at the end is possible. But Greg would eventually move on to even younger prey, continuing the exact same pattern and cycle, and documenting it all online. And the next victim was named Kai. During the majority of the events that occurred with Greg, Kai did not yet identify as a trans man. Everything will reflect Kai's current name and pronouns, and my team and I will do our best to blur out and censor out Kai's former name and former pronouns. Gregory and Kai have legally changed their name to James Jackson and Lucas Jackson, and while it's unknown why they've both legally changed their name, it could be assumed that they probably did it to get away from the internet backlash associated with their former names and the bad reputations. Because of Kai being transgender, this has been a difficult thing for me to navigate. People change their names legally for many reasons. Because he is now living a private life, it's hard to say if he changed his name to hide his identity and for legal reasons or if it relates directly to his identity. To the best of my knowledge and research, the last time Gregory's husband has publicly spoken about this matter, he has said that he would like to be referred to as Kai, and I would never want to assume someone's preferred or chosen name without them speaking on it, especially if they live a private life just by what their legal name change has been. A chosen or preferred name is the use of a first, middle, and or last name that is different from a person's legal name. There are many reasons why someone would use a chosen name, such as a reflection of a gender identity, as a nickname, or as a westernized or Americanized name. I want to be as respectful as possible of his gender and identity because it is a separate thing from the darkness of this story. Of course, I am always learning, but because he is now private, it makes it a difficult matter to speak to. I strongly disagree with dead naming, which is referring to the name someone used before they transitioned. And it's important to note that health experts and LGBT advocacy groups advise adopting transgender people's name and pronouns even when referring to them prior to transitioning. That being said, the time that this legal name name change happened was post-transition after both Kai and Greg had received a lot of backlash online and both of them changed their legal name. This alongside the fact that there's been no public statement stating that Kai has a different preferred or chosen name makes me feel like the legal name change was for safety reasons until it's otherwise spoken. So I will continue to refer to Greg's partner as Kai as the last it's been publicly addressed that is his preferred name. That being said, I want to 
remain as respectful as possible, and also any hateful comments towards Kai's gender and identity will not be tolerated. Dedicated supporters would sit through hours of Onision content where he would talk about all of his relationship troubles. One of these viewers was Kai, who initially discovered Greg when Shane Dawson uploaded the video of him and Greg kissing at VidCon in 2011. Now, initially discovered me through a video I did with Shane Dawson where we kissed. This video was released on August 6th of 2011, so Kai would have been 16 years old at the time. Later that year, when Greg was having relationships relationship troubles with his then fiance Shiloh, Kai would begin tweeting at him almost daily for a few months until Greg eventually contacted him. On September 14th, 2011, Kai sent his first tweet to Greg. At Onision, I want to put up with your bullshit, Greg. This was a response to a now deleted video Greg posted titled Single Again about his breakup with Adrian, where Greg says, I just want to say that Adrian deserves someone way better than me and I deserve someone who wants to put up with my bullshit. Greg deserves someone who wants to put up with his bullshit. It's bizarre how true that statement would eventually become. Kai tweeted at Greg six more times in September. On October 21st, Kai tweeted a list of six celebrities that he would marry, and Onision was number three. The next day, Greg replied to him, that's sweet of you to say, and Kai continued to tweet Greg a total of 20 times in December of 2011. Tweeted you a few times, or, or occasionally. Kai tweeted at Greg, a total of 27 times in January. On January 9th, Kai was worried about not tweeting him. I haven't tweeted at Onision in like two days. At Onision, sometimes I feel like I miss you, even though we've never met or talked. It's odd. Kai was slowly becoming the perfect vulnerable target who would do and say anything Greg wanted. Because of the parasocial bond that was forming in Kai's mind between himself and Greg. After breaking up with his fiance Shiloh for the last time, Greg tweeted out, Soulmate, where are you? On February 12th, 2012. And Kai replied, here. In 2012, I tweeted something like, is my soulmate out there? And this tweeted back that he was that person. I was already following this on Twitter. So Greg DM'd Kai on Twitter. You really think you're my soulmate? If so, what makes you feel this way? And Greg and Kai began privately dating that same month. Kai was 17 and Greg was 26. And then you were like, how old are you? And I was like, well, I'm almost 18. <laughs> and you were like, well, if you ever want to talk. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, you did. And I was like, mm-mm, you ain't going anywhere. I still feel deceived. I was born in May. <laughs> you were not born in May. Well, actually the states we were in, it didn't even it didn't matter. matter. Greg first told Kai he loved him around this time over text. And Greg proposed to Kai before ever meeting him in person, saying, you know I'm going to marry you, right? Over Skype. Not even meeting each other in person yet. I proposed in probably the least classy way possible. I proposed via video over the internet. In such a weird way. I basically Ooh. said it like this. You know I'm gonna marry you, right? So one time I followed this guy on Twitter and then he proposed to me. Then in March of 2012, Greg flew down to New Mexico, where Kai was living, to see Kai. The couple met at a coffee shop and had lunch before visiting a park, where they shared their first kiss. And apparently, Greg gave Kai a ring when they met in person for the first time. So things were pretty swell for a while. He clearly indicated he was interested in marrying me. And so we finally actually met. I gave the ring. Um, ignore the fact I put the ring on the wrong finger. That didn't actually happen in real life. I loved the ring and so did I. Greg later confessed that he he and Kai had s within hours of meeting. First time, this one's embarrassing. It was, it's like, a, say, first time we hugged, but we literally fucked the same day. <laughs> <laughs> the first time we literally had physical contact, we were like in bed with each other hours later. I don't want to go into the details there. In early March of 2012, Greg began wearing a ring. And around that time, Kai began showing off an engagement ring on social media. Eventually, because of Greg and Kai's Twitter activity, people began to compare Greg's 
indoor filming locations with Kai's Instagram photos, and the rooms were identical. Viewers also noticed that Greg was in a different location that wasn't in Washington. Eventually, people discovered that Greg was renting a home in New Mexico. Apparently, Greg was in New Mexico to be with Kai while waiting for them to finish high school. On October 22nd, 2012, six days after Kai turned 18, Kai and Greg officially announced their relationship together in an Instagram post. But Kai and Greg each have matching 27 tattoos for the date February 27th, 2012, which is believed and fairly confirmed to be the day that the two started dating. And pretty soon after, Greg and Kai were married through the New Mexico court system on November 14th of 2012. But Greg and Kai never announced their marriage online and even kept it hidden from their family. But the internet found out about Greg and Kai's marriage a week later when an ex-friend of Kai's posted about it onto Tumblr. So this is how fast I moved. February, we started dating. By December, we lived together in our own house. We have a dog. We're married, dude. We're also married. <laughs> Over the next few years, Greg would reveal even more friction between himself and Kai's family, doing what he seemed to do with all of his previous relationships, attempting to isolate Kai from his family. In April of 2015, it seemed Greg was trying to convince Kai to stop associating with his father. Greg indirectly called Kai immoral on Twitter for associating with someone who threatened their significant other. And now now let's talk about Mr. Grump. Mr. Grump wanted to meet me at Olive Garden. We'll say that's an olive. So Mr. Grump is sitting across the table from me at Olive Garden. Our conversation was kind of chill at first, but then his eyes started turning red. He started getting teary because Mr. Grump decided to threaten my well-being despite my relationship with being legal, he also threatened to put me in prison, despite, again, our relationship being totally legal. So you threatened to seriously harm me and possibly kill me, as well as threaten me in other ways? F that guy. Because Kai's father had threatened Greg when Kai and Greg had initially started dating because Obviously, Greg was a fully grown adult in his late 20s who was dating someone who hadn't even finished high school. Greg also regularly attacked Kai's family on social media, revealing private information he learned about the family members from Kai. But this didn't stop Kai and Greg from continuing their relationship and even building a family together themselves. In June of 2013, Kai announced that he was pregnant with a picture of his baby bump on Tumblr. Newest addition to the family coming late December, early January. Later that same day, he deleted the image and posted to Tumblr and Twitter, congrats guys, you've officially lost all of your picture privileges. Good job. Thanks for being extremely rude. And Greg and Kai ended up keeping their children completely off the internet, as well as hiding all information about their pregnancies. Eventually, Kai would post photos about his pregnancies on a YouTube video video, and Greg made a music video and song for his son, and would occasionally reference being a parent. But for the most part, they kept their life of being parents hidden from social media. Many viewers wondered if Kai was eventually going to create a YouTube channel. Initially, Kai was focused on pursuing medicine and wasn't interested in the YouTube platform. But in 2015, Kai created a Facebook fan page, a YouNow, and a YouTube account. Though throughout Kai's YouTube career, many drama followers theorized that Greg actually ran Kai's account, mainly due to the style of writing used in the videos, as well as the fact that the video's titles and descriptions would often misgender Kai, referring to him as wife or girlfriend and using she, her pronouns. In 2016, Kai and Greg had their second child, and Kai hid the pregnancy completely from the internet, though later Kai would reveal pregnancy photos in a YouTube video. I took a lot more pictures during this pregnancy, apparently, probably because I didn't have such horrible self steam issue. This is a comparison picture with my last pregnancy. So on the left, you see me 40 weeks with my first pregnancy. On the right, you see me 27 weeks with my second. Kai and Greg would also vent tweet about private fights between themselves. Kai would usually vaguely or bluntly complain about something Greg said or did. Meanwhile, Greg would say he doesn't deserve his significant other or even talk about how he's verbally or emotionally abused. Then, eventually, in their relationship, Kai and Greg decided to try 
to explore non-monogamy and polyamorous relationships because this is such a stable relationship, why not add another dynamic into the mix? Of course, non-monogamy and polyamory would be their business if they didn't make it everyone else's business, and wouldn't be problematic if Greg's old manipulative actions didn't return in a big way. And Kai, now a full-grown adult, also participating in the toxic cycles as well. The couple's exploration with non-monogamy started with Kai beginning to date women outside of his and Greg's relationship. The first relationship Kai had, or at least the first one he posted about publicly, was with a girl named Billy. Kai first noticed Billy on Twitter when a photo of her was retweeted onto his timeline. Kai messaged her and asked if she was interested before giving her his phone number. She posted a picture and it got retweeted onto my timeline and I tweeted at her to date me. Later on down the line I saw that she was single so I messaged her and I asked her, you know, are you interested in girls? And I gave her my number. At the time, Billy was 18, Kai was 21, and Greg was 30. Kai claimed Greg was the one that pushed them to date Billy, and that it was actually Greg's idea in the first place. Billy came to visit Kai and Greg in early December of 2015. According to Greg, this was so Kai and Billy could get to know one another because they planned on dating. Came out with a video openly saying to everyone that but I even encouraged her to get a girlfriend. He told me that they kissed at the airport and things generally seemed okay. And while Billy was over, Greg posted tons of statuses and images encouraging Kai and Billy's relationship. Greg posted an image of the two kissing and even called them his OPT, or one true pairing. Greg also made a sketch video titled Onision's Leaves Him for a Woman. I'm coming for you. Come to me. Almost there. Wait, what? That's right. Oh my god, no. This feels so right without whiskers. Which is just weird behavior. This feeling of someone just capitalizing off of their partner who's exploring their identity. Greg says that during this visit, Kai became very upset and even cried because Billy and Greg were spending a lot of time together, rather than Billy concentrating on getting to know Kai. I was initially pretty excited for her to come, but girlfriend missed the first flight. Her missing that flight on a certain level confirmed suspicions that this girl didn't really care about. Kai felt that Billy might have been there for Greg and not really for Kai, but Billy denied this. Greg says that one night he, Billy, and Kai were about to have a three-way, but Kai stopped it. If a girlfriend is kissing her lips, I was kissing her neck, and vice versa. The next day, Greg texted Kai, telling Kai that he was aroused, and asked if he could cuddle Billy. We were having a conversation, and I said, no, I need affection. And I said, okay, I'm really aroused, and I feel an intense need for cuddling as well. I then asked for permission to cuddle with her girlfriend, and then followed that with, or you can cuddle me, question mark. As you can imagine, I was very upset by that. They didn't say she wanted to leave the house, so I began helping her pack. As I was helping her pack, I told her that her girlfriend and I wouldn't do anything that friends wouldn't do together. Conscious or not, I clearly was manipulating. After Kai left, Greg gave Billy a body massage and cuddled while watching movies, and he says they fell asleep cuddling in Kai's bed. The rest of the night, we cuddled and watched movies. Greg told Kai about what he did with Billy the next day, and according to both of them, Kai broke up with him. Kai also posted onto Twitter that Greg left him for Billy and is in love with her. That night, Billy opened up a You Now stream. When asked why Kai was freaking out, she said, I don't know. She says Kai and Greg were okay with the situation until they weren't. And they were okay with it until they weren't. Yeah, they were okay with it until they weren't. That's pretty much what happened. This is just a theory, but I think subconsciously Kai began to realize and see maybe that Greg used him and encouraged his relationship with Billy in order to lure Billy in and use the exact same tactics that Greg used on Kai when Kai was only 17, which has to be traumatizing to see play out right in front of you. In the live stream, Billy said she thought it was immature of Kai to instantly post the information 
information to Twitter, even though the internet is his escape, because Kai has a following and needs to understand that what he says takes a toll on people. Anybody. Like, everyone's a good person, you guys are making it all seem like, or all awful like people. So sorry. And, then, and like, I'm not a bad person either, but like, it, it was kind of immature to like, post what she did on Twitter instantly, because the internet is her escape. But she needs to realize she has a following, and what he says does take a toll on people. It seems, in my opinion, after Kai's boundary was clearly crossed, Greg continued to try to manipulate the situation behind the scenes to keep Kai in his life, not only because it would reflect poorly on him if they separated, but because Kai would become a great tool for luring in younger girls into what they would slowly define as a thruple. It seems like and there have been cases of this, you know, throughout criminal history that they were working together as a team to get Billy, yeah, manipulate her, right. use her for sex, then exploit her. They did the same thing with Sarah, mm -hmm. ultimately with Shiloh, to a certain extent with you being there. Um, all these young women, and we don't even know how many there are out there. I mean, we've interviewed, you know, uh, uh, a half a dozen. Yeah. So Kai and Greg announced that they would go to counseling to work on their relationship, and Greg immediately started joking about the situation on his YouTube channel, creating a weird prank video, I guess, pretending he separated from Kai again. Still allowing me visitation rights, which is great because a dad should be in his kid's life. But seriously, in the previous videos, I kept saying I am not the victim. To go and support her. But this time, I feel a lot more like the victim. Allegedly, after seeing this prank video, Billy thought it was real and told Greg that she was ready for a relationship with him. And Greg later showed off this text message in his prank reveal video. Remember me sending this text to that woman I cuddled behind my back? Well, after the recent video I released announcing that we split, she decided to contact me yet again. She said she wanted to come back out and play video games with me. And that I quote, I somehow caught feelings for you pretty fast. Not sure if it's completely normal, but the way you treated me was better than anyone has treated me before. So here I am. Well, that's pretty flattering. Which to me feels like this prank video was meant to bait Billy into texting him so that he and Kai could reel Billy back into the toxic relationship. In May of 2016, Kai began expressing missing Billy on Twitter. Within the next two months, Kai began talking more and more about Billy on Twitter and eventually posted a photo of him and Billy kissing for the Twitter hashtag keep kissing, a tag for LGBT couples to post kissing photos. And six months after the breakup, Kai decided to take Billy back. Even after all of this, I could not get over her. I was angry for two months and then I missed her. I don't know. I kind of thought, you know, if, if it's been this long and I'm still missing her, there has to be something, you know, this has to mean something. One night at like 2 a.m., this is in like June, so like six months later, I couldn't sleep and I decided to text her. I told her I wanted closure because I couldn't get over her. I was still hurting. I couldn't figure out what to do, so I wanted some closure or something like that. But that just kind of spiraled into us talking again. And in June of 2016, Greg uploaded a video of Kai where blue hair can be seen in the background. The next day, Greg posted a seemingly very random rant where he talked about how he had multiple amazing threesomes with two awesome individuals. Greg began referring to their relationship as a menage a trois in September and would continue until the rest of the relationship. It was very hard for me to trust that she wasn't after Greg and that they weren't going to betray my trust again and leave me for each other. That caused a lot of issues for everybody and I will admit that that's my fault. Okay, so how did this go from Kai saying that he was uncomfortable with Greg and Billy even cuddling, that this was a boundary they didn't even want to cross, to all of a sudden threesomes and a menage a trois? Like usual, I was being kind of put on the back burner and I was being ignored and excluded. And because of that, I got really anxious, I got really uncomfortable, and during the intimate moment, I kind of shut down because I was feeling so uncomfortable and anxious, and that just, pissed everybody off again because my insecurity was getting the best of me and 
affecting people negatively. And whenever a disagreement broke out between Greg and Kai, Greg and Billy would still remain in contact. Greg would take photos with Billy and even one time recorded a video with Billy cuddled up next to him, which upset Kai. There was a big issue with the fact that I was clearly struggling and I needed some reassurance and instead it would just both ignore me and hang out together if they were mad at me. Though Greg and Kai would constantly send Billy home and then invite her back into their house in this consistent toxic cycle. By late October, Billy and her best friend Ayala visited Greg and Kai. At this time, Kai's online friend Sarah was living with Greg and Kai. All three girls were appearing in Greg's online content at the time. Oh, it's the usual. I actually have females here to judge bodies. Today on our bro, we're actually going to do gaming, which was originally why this channel was created. So, have fun. Another day, more horror games. Ready, set, go. But by November 3rd, viewers noticed that Greg and Kai had unfollowed Billy on Twitter. On November 9th, Greg uploaded the video, We Broke Up, again. Hey, let's bring the third person back. And I was just shocked. Everyone that I know of was telling that's a bad idea, including myself. But I wound up agreeing to her coming back because I really liked hanging out, playing video games, etc. with that person. So the third person came back and we all wound up making love to each other a lot. It was pretty insanely awesome. Unfortunately, my anxiety issues got to me again and gave her the idea that once more that the third person was just there for me and didn't like her at all. The last time I talked to my about relationships, I told her I wanted to be single. Because to be blunt, I'm emotionally exhausted. Why are you guys in a polyamorous relationship if you're not ready to be in a polyamorous relationship? Greg claims this point was his breaking point and he told Kai that there would be no more rules and boundaries. That sounds like a healthy relationship and that Greg would be able to do whatever he wants. Greg believed that the relationship wasn't balanced or a true trinity because Kai Kai and Billy could do whatever they wanted, but Greg couldn't do whatever he wanted to with Billy. Greg comes to me and tells me, you know, this is going to be a true polyamorous relationship. I'm going to do what I want when it's the three of us. And that's that. And I said, okay, because I kind of took that as he's going to do what he wants when it's the three of us together. And that was fine. I wasn't going to be insecure. I wasn't going to cause a problem. Uh, apparently he meant that he was gonna do whatever he wants all the time, meaning they could exclusively do whatever they wanted. I was not sure what he meant. I expressed to Billy, hey, I don't know what he means by this. She suggested to me that I should tell her my boundaries so that she could keep this situation in check and that she would respect my boundaries. I trusted her with that. I tell her, look, I'm not comfortable with you guys like being exclusive yet. And Billy told me, of course. And the next day, he and Billy slept together. And was there one thing that happened that made you say to Billy, we got to get out of here. This is wrong, potentially yeah. dangerous. I think it was the day after, um, like Greg had coerced Billy into sleeping with him, um, even though she very evidently told her that, told him that she was uncomfortable with it. Billy, she came up to me and she was like, um, like I tried to tell him more than a couple times that I was uncomfortable with it and that I would be uncomfortable with it. And I think it's a really bad idea. Um, but he just kept pushing and pushing and something that Kai has admitted himself, um, is that Greg is somebody who's really, really hard to say no to because he will just keep pushing and pushing and pushing or sort of changing the way that he asks until you cave. Um, and she came upstairs just absolutely bawling in tears. Um, but after that happened, essentially everybody in the whole house just started attacking Billy and like... They were like getting in screaming fights. Um, so Greg like sat us all down and had us sign a contract, essentially agreeing to stay for another week. Sign a so, contract? Yeah, um, he like typed up this contract, essentially saying that like, we agreed to stay for a week. We agreed to like, try to work things out and like keep the peace in the house and be nice to everybody. After what I saw Billy go through and after um, you know, the contracts and him trying to force her to get a tattoo. I was just like, hey, Billy, like, we really need to get out of here. Greg said that before sleeping with Billy, Billy tried to tell him that Kai might be upset if they slept together. Billy did tell me that she thought 
might be upset. She and I slept together. He says when Kai came home, Greg told him that he and Billy slept together. He says that Kai was very upset because in a secret conversation that Kai had with Billy, he told Billy not to do anything exclusive with Greg and Billy agreed. Specifically told Billy that she was still not to do anything exclusively with me. Billy told my that was no problem. And according to even told her that if I did pursue having sex with her that she would literally tell me to screw off. And I get home the next day and Greg takes me upstairs and he tells me that they had sex. And obviously I'm very upset and I tell him that I told her that that was not okay. I made my boundaries very clear to her that that was something I did not want to happen. So I decided, you know, this is, I can't be with her after this. She very clearly cheated on me. So I broke things off with her. I don't want to see her. I don't want to talk to her. I want nothing to do with her. She gets angry and she goes out into the woods or the backyard. I don't really know. So we all decide to like sit down and have a talk about what happened, how we're going to be civil. I'm trying to figure out like how on earth she's trying to justify the fact that she very clearly cheated on me. And she's just sitting there, oh, saying, saying, oh no, it was just too hard to say no. This is just putting a lot of pressure onto Billy. So it seemed that everyone broke up, but of course, again, they all seemingly got back together. And a month later, Billy appeared in an uh oh bro gaming video with Greg, letting everyone know they were back together and that Billy was once again back in their home. Now, Billy is an eagle flying through France, allegedly. But this new cycle didn't last very long, and finally, there was a final breakup. On January 10th, 2017, viewers once again noticed that Greg and Kai had unfollowed Billy on Twitter. The next day, Greg uploaded a video, again, titled, Our Relationship is Over. In the video, Greg explains that he and Kai are anti po but dated someone who was pro pop. He says that they decided to break up with this person because this person lied about it and clearly prioritized pop more than us. And then she tells Greg that she smoked while she was gone. And I just said, this is my out. There's too many warning signs. I've been through too much. I need to take my out. We broke up with her. My problem with all of this is not with My problem is that she agreed not to and she did it anyway. Then Greg tweeted, never date a stoner. And soon after, Billy tweeted, never date an idiot. Greg also shared text messages between himself and Billy. In the text, Greg asks Billy how she could treat himself and Kai the way she did, that she supposedly lied and betrayed them. And Billy replied with the now infamous line, LOL, be mad, which Greg eventually made into merch for himself. Because if there's one thing Greg knows how to do really well, it's how to capitalize off of the relationship trauma that he puts young girls through. It sounds like they're almost trying to drag you into a reality show of some sort. Am I wrong there? I mean, he definitely, or Greg definitely would post a video every time after something like this would happen. So I definitely think like a little bit was like exploited. Billy's friend Ayala joined the Twitter fight and revealed some really disturbing details about the relationship between Kai, Greg, and Billy. Apparently, there were stipulations that Greg gave Billy in order for her to be considered to be taken back by Kai and Greg. Different conditions Ayala mentioned were that Greg told Billy that she could not see her family for over a year to shave her head to get a tattoo that said I'm a liar, to get a fake tan, to dye her hair green, and shave off her eyebrows. Greg replied that he told Billy she wasn't allowed to see drugs users and called Ayala a lying prick. He says she was only upset because that included her, but also that would include Billy's family as well. Did Greg manipulate and try to control you? Yeah, for sure. We've heard stories about him shaving girls' heads. Did he ever do that to you? Um, no, uh, but he wanted to. He, he wanted to. And, and, and and what's the purpose of this? Um, I mean, he told me it was to be able to be forgiven, um, to like prove that I 
I like love them and I'm not sh like sure I'm sure it was to you know make me like embarrassed or make me like not like myself as much because I do care a lot about my hair and he very clearly knew that like I want to be a cosmetologist so it was just one of those like you know just like a jab at you shave your head like they asked Billy to quit her job so that they would have like free access to fly her up whatever they wanted quit her um, job yeah, so she, she had a full-time job, um, and they essentially asked her to quit her job so that they could fly her up whenever they wanted because they weren't satisfied with the fact that they could not pick her schedule, essentially. They took a very, very long time to sort of break Billy down and make her feel really, really bad about anything that she had done. Um, he asked um, Billy to shave her head. He asked Billy to um, dye all of her hair green and get a fake tan to um, completely remove her eyebrows um, and also to chain her up in the basement for a week. Um, and that's something that he brings up frequently because she blatantly said absolutely not to all of these requests. And then he would shame her and be like, oh, like, you're boring and I can't believe you don't want to do this, crazy things. Oh, another thing that um, he tried to do was have her move to Washington State and not talk to anybody that she knew anymore, um, like me or her family, no Just one. Just to so isolate her. Yeah, he was, he was aiming for complete and total isolation. He asked her to move out there and not talk to a single person that she knew for an entire year. On January 18th of 2017, Greg uploaded the video initially titled, It's Over, I'm Done, Bye, which he quickly renamed, one, you lied again, two, you committed a crime again, three, you got dumped again, four, bye forever. Greg disturbingly reveals a contract he wrote up for Kai and Billy over text messages in this video. Here's the contract I proposed. I said, hey, beautiful people, here's our contract we all agree to one always be honest two never let jealousy negatively impact our relationship three never use manipulative language Four, never partake in illegal activity five express all issues that come up directly with the person we have an issue with six do our very best to stay positive if you agree please respond with I agree and we're all of course very good with this contract this was December 22nd so Billy wound up violating that contract so I dumped her <laughs> is anyone else's mind not blown by this and says that since Billy broke the contract, he broke up with her. In the video, Greg says the only way he and Kai would take Billy back is if she avoided illegal drug users with the exception of holidays, which included her family. After I broke up with her, we had a discussion and I concluded that considering how many times she had lied to us in the past, again, this was definitely not the first offense. She had done many things prior. That the only way we would take her back is if she would avoid illegal users for a year with the exception of holidays. Now Billy and Ayala will rephrase that and say, oh I tried to keep her from seeing her family. And that's because a good portion of Billy's family members are legal drug users. As Billy admits here, for just this year you would only see illegal drug users on the holidays. You ask me why I keep wording it like that and I say because this is not about family, it is about legal drug users. Saying your family distracts from the point. He says, but my family smokes. Well you know what, that's not my problem. What? What? Therefore, this condition, which may have been made to sound like a reasonable thing, was actually a way to completely isolate Billy from all of her friends and family that she had back in her home state. He then tells the audience that he wants to tell them how set Billy's life was before she threw it all away. Greg claims that he was going to buy Billy a car, which to me sounds like future faking, saying that at some unknown date, you're going to do some grand gesture for somebody. Now let me tell you how set Billy's life was before she everything away. I made it very clear to Billy that I was going to buy her a car. He claimed that he was going to teach her how to drive. He was going to pay for her cosmetology school. Despite her almost being 20, she still doesn't know how to drive, so I was going to teach her how to drive. I was going to pay for her cosmetology school. I was going to pay to fix her teeth. Again, at some unknown future date, he was going to do this thing. Greg claimed that he paid off her medical debts, hired her to work for him, and paid her $10,000. It's my theory that those are all the same thing, that just by him hiring her to work for him, she was able to pay off her medical debts and he paid her the accumulation of $10,000 through her working for him. Those aren't three separate things. That's just my theory. Billy's last two text messages to Greg were, you're the worst person I have ever met in my life and F you. What's the last thing you said to them? 
Uh, I'm pretty sure I sent like a in all caps F you and then blocked their number and like never spoke to them again. Um, but I still get I, emails. It's been like three years and I have like over 20 emails from Greg. Like, Saying what? what? Are they trying to get you back out there? Oh, yeah. And in reply to this, Greg lashed out by tweeting a list of negative experiences that Billy had with her exes that she had told Greg in confidence. And some of those were very private private, sensitive information that you wouldn't want the general public to know about. What's the worst thing he posted about you online? I'm not really like entirely big on like talking about it. Right. Only and, you know, if you're uncomfortable, don't don't go there. I don't want you to I don't want you to, to have a bad experience, but I do want people to know what he's capable of doing. You know, so as far as you're comfortable characterizing what he did, it sounds like he gained your confidence, got some deep personal information about you and exploited it. Is that fair to say? Yeah. In a very hurtful way. Yeah, on like several occasions. Billy tweeted, Posting my private information, I've only told as many people as I can count on my hand is beyond low. And it seems that for the most part was the end of the relationship between Greg, Kai, and Billy, where there was, in my opinion, a lot of manipulation at play on Greg's part, a lot of power imbalances, and in my opinion, Billy probably left off much worse than before she had met Kai and Greg. I know that a lot of people are going to tell me that I shouldn't make this video, but I'm honestly sick of not standing up for myself. I don't want to have to deal with this situation anymore. So, Onision, please stop harassing me and my best friend. I am tired of seeing your tweets, tired of being tagged in your tweets, of you just harassing us, telling us we're awful, ugly people. Please leave me alone. Stop talking about me. Don't speak about me in your videos. I'm done. Like, I hope you're happy. You completely like destroyed all of my pride. You told me to get a tattoo saying I'm a liar. Like a stamp. You told me to shave my head. You told me to dye my hair green, shave off my eyebrows, and get an ugly tan. Like, is that not abusive to you? Do you think that's a fair trade for me telling you that I did? Like, that's what you think is okay? I betrayed your trust? You fucking betrayed my trust. You told everyone secrets about me. Fucking everyone. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You wanted to chain me up in your basement and then manipulated the situation to tell me I was boring so I would agree to it because you made me feel bad. And then on top of that, you told everyone that you only thought I was really attractive and that's why you stayed with me. Like, so I was just like a plaything. You didn't actually love me. So like, why are you talking about love like you even know what love is? Is Kai just as bad as uh, Onision, Greg? Uh, yeah. For sure. During all this time, Greg was doing other horrific things online to show his true personality. It should be noted that Onision had a horrific reaction to the death of Christina Grimmy, who was an influencer who died in a horrific way and was sh at a meet and greet. Christina was a dedicated Christian, and after she passed, Greg would tweet mocking God, which was just extremely insensitive at the time. And after Christina's death was confirmed, Greg accused fans and YouTubers of tweeting fake empathy and being full of sh as if they just wanted attention. Meanwhile, Onision was clearly tweeting for attention in the whole situation. Greg has self-published three books, Stones to Abigail, which was self-published in 2015, This Is Why I Hate You, which was self-published in 2015, and Reaper's Creek, which was self-published in 2018. All of these book covers look like a different version of Ransom Letters. His 2016 book review, Aged Well, needs to be on an FBI watch list or in a padded cell. Onision's book, with a quote that reads, Magical made-up status you people call 
call a legal adult. Yikes. And here are some interesting quotes from Onision's books. In his book, Stones to Abigail, for as long as I can remember, I've enjoyed seeing how people move around and talk to each other like they're all animals at the zoo. I would try to deliver a more accurate analogy if I felt there was one, but so many of them seemed incredibly unaware of themselves, just living life as if it were some generic predefined routine. Sometimes I felt like an alien who had a VIP pass to submerge myself in primitive human culture just for entertainment. Um, delusions of grandeur much? in an excerpt from This Is Why I Hate You. How do you express yourself to people when you don't feel they're worth the time? They wouldn't even begin to understand me if I tried. If I even began to try and explain what was going on in my mind on a daily basis to the average person, I would be thrown in a padded cell. How do you express yourself to people when they're living in an entirely different world than you? They're living a goddamn lie and they can't help it because they barely qualify as self-aware. Onision seems to think that everyone else in the world is just an NPC and he's the only one who's experiencing this human existence. Greg has done a lot of questionable videos on YouTube. Hey, Greggy Poo, remember when you did the Guess My Age videos? The internet remembers. Why would a married man have such an obsession with the ages of his fans? I really wonder. With the video titles like, are these people legal? Guess their age. What? Guess their age. Guess how old these girls are. Guess how old these girls are, challenge. Well, if they're called girls, you shouldn't be wanting to know their age. Teen challenge, age laws. Oh, what? Have Onision rate you 1 through 10. Have a zero rate me? No, thank you. Age challenged relationships. Oh my goodness. I like how when he was debating Blair White, he said you couldn't guess someone's age just by looking at them. And here he is trying to guess people's ages just by looking at them. When Blair and Greg debate, Blair White talks about how there's a lot of underage looking girls on Onision's forums. And his retort is something else. Uh, so when I see you making videos, so when I see you, so when I see you making videos of thirteen-year-old girls, fifteen-year-old girls, how even seventeen-year-old girls, it's really weird. You know, girls in leggings, and sports bras, and you know your name written on their, and your name. I'm gonna have to mute you if you just talk over me. I'll let you talk after I'm done. I promise I'll let you talk. But when I see like Onision written on their hip bones, these young girls, and like girls in sports bras, and you know, I have actually the receipts. I actually have the archives of your forums up on my browser right now of all these sure. girls. Very scantily clad, very underage, very underdeveloped. You don't, you don't um, know their age, though. That's the problem. You, it, you can tell. Yeah, you can actually tell by looking at them that they're actually, extremely young. Actually, and what you like to actually, do, what I you like to do, dated somebody who was 19 and they were not developed. So, <laughs> I'm sure that's how you like him, Greg. I'm sure you like him very underdeveloped. But the point is, actually, I like know, I like people of like of all ages who are not developed, so long as they're you know past. <laughs> Puberty by like. Greg, you just years. stated that you like girls who are not developed. Are you and you want to be mad at me for making no. you look like a creep? No, I, I said that I like right a variety now. of mature women. Greg also had a period of time in 2016 where he made constant videos about Eugenia Cooney. So this is a recent status from Eugenia Cooney. If you're having trouble locating her in the photo, she's directly in the middle. She's actually holding that phone you see hovering there. Onision even made a video pretending to be Eugenia Cooney in The Sims, making fun of her constantly. Now, I'm not sure if I should even show clips from this video because it's clear that videos like this, not only in general, trigger those with EDs, but also Eugenia has stated she doesn't like these videos and I can't imagine how it could affect her mental health to continue to see videos like these. But just to show how low Greg stooped, I'll show a quick clip from this video, one of the least harmful parts, just to show how disgusting Greg is. This is a story of a girl named Eugenia Cooney, a YouTuber who influences hundreds of thousands. But for some reason, her refrigerator appears to not. <laughs> In the span of a year, his videos would ping pong back and forth from being positive about Eugenia Cooney 
Now we're going to Google skinny supermodel and we'll see if she better fits in that crowd. Yep, that's basically Eugenia Cooney's body. Once again, that looks like Eugenia Cooney to me. And there you go. So basically Eugenia Cooney has the body of a skinny supermodel. To pretending to care for Eugenia Cooney and Eugenia's health. I feel like it's completely reasonable at this point to be seriously concerned about Eugenia Cooney. Eugenia, let's say we'll give you a month. You have a month to show progress to gain weight. It's not a video created for the sake of drama. This is an incredibly serious issue that absolutely needs to be addressed by literally every YouTuber and person who crosses paths with Eugenia Cooney. Eugenia would even go on you now and say that Greg's videos were not helping the situation. Super soon after, he made like one video towards me that wasn't exactly very nice. And then from there, just kind of kept making more and more. Ah, of course, Eugenia Cooney would pop up. Someone did Photoshop on her and how good she would look if she actually had some pounds on her. And chick needs to eat more food. Greg continued to make videos on Eugenia, even confessing that he did this because the videos always do extremely well. <laughs> Something you should understand is that the point of me making these videos is not to hurt Eugenia Cooney. But I want this to be my final video on Eugenia Cooney, despite the fact that a huge amount of you have shown significant interest in the last two videos I made about her. Eugenia at one point had to go onto Twitter to defend from misinformation that Greg was spreading about her. Eventually, Greg decided to stop making videos, even though he claimed he could continue making millions upon millions of views from them. Regardless, I know I can make plenty of more Eugenia videos to get millions upon millions of collective views from them, but I am officially resigning from the topic. In 2017, Greg and Kai began to search for a new third. During this time, Greg had grown a community through Patreon, Discord, and YouNow, and Greg invited several female fans that he met through these platforms to his home to be his camera person. Greg never seemed to invite any male fans to be his camera person, and Greg also did not seek any fans who had any camera experience. Greg claimed he was looking for hardcore fans and encouraged women who did not have any camera experience to learn how to operate a camera. This on top of the fact that Greg was perfectly fine operating a camera on his own up until now, added to the theory that Greg was using his needing a cameraman as a guise to invite women into his home who he was romantically interested in. After Greg messaged me on Twitter saying, how would you like to come out to do camera work with us? Camera work? Yeah, camera work. What did you, did you have any training as a photographer, a videographer? <laughs> no, absolutely none. So I knew, I knew it was just an excuse to have me over. One of those women was Beck. Beck says she found Greg through a recommended video when she was 20. Beck then found Kai through Greg's videos and immediately became enamored with them. And Beck joined Greg's Patreon and began interacting with Greg through his Discord voice chat and with Kai through his YouNow streams. Beck says she found Kai attractive and eventually wanted to be romantic with him. So she began frequently donating to Kai's YouNow streams to get his attention. And Beck estimates she donated about $200 to $300. I saw that um, Kai was streaming and Greg had a Discord. Um, and then later on uh, through you now, I uh, started talking to Kai like through mainly, uh, he would notice me when I donated. On July 26, 2017, Beck recorded and uploaded a song for Kai, which she named a like song because she didn't want to call it a love song. According to Beck, Kai and Greg loved the song, and Kai told her he wanted to see where things go, so the two began speaking privately. I was probably the main pursuer in it. The way that I actually got Kai to notice me, besides donating all the time was I wrote him a song. He thought it was a beautiful song and that's actually how I started uh, talking to Kai privately was after that song. He said that he wanted to see where things would go after that 
Beck says after being contacted by Kai, she spoke to Greg about almost everything and spoke with Kai through texts and streams. And around this time, Greg invited Beck to their home to do camera work for them. Beck had no experience with a camera and knew that this was just an excuse to have her over. After Kai told me that he liked me and he wanted to see where things were going, uh, a couple days after, Greg messaged me on Twitter saying, how would you like to come out to do camera work with us? Did you have any training as a photographer, <laughs> a videographer? No, absolutely none. So I knew I knew it was just an excuse to have me over. On August 7th, Beck tweeted, there will be shaving cream in my ear for the rest of my life and I've accepted it. And some people thought this was a hint at a video that she must have filmed with Greg. Suspicions were confirmed when Greg uploaded a Patreon exclusive video titled I Flew a Patreon Out. The post featured a new video dubbed Cream People with himself and Beck covered in shaving cream. The video was uploaded to Onision's main channel the next day titled What Onision Does With His Fans, Shaving Cream. Was that money worth it looking back? No, <laughs> definitely not. Some viewers were shocked that Onision and Beck were so physical with one another during the shaving cream scenes. While Beck was staying with Onision and Kai, Beck would continue to appear in Greg's You Now streams and in his videos. But Beck would never appear in any of Kai's streams. So many suspected that Kai did not get along with Beck, which Kai confirmed when he said that he high key wanted to die in a stream when Beck was over because he was tired of people betraying his trust. Why do you want to die? Because I'm very stressed and I'm very tired of people breaking my trust. On the stream, he says that Greg did tell him he was going to fly back out, but never told him when he would do it or that he bought the tickets. While Kai was streaming, Beck took to Discord to live post about clogging Greg and Kai's toilet. Because of this, during Kai's stream, Kai was bombarded with comments about Beck and the toilet. And a few days later, Greg uploaded an Onision sketch video about the toilet situation. <laughs> Are you, are you all right? I need a plunger! What's going on? <gasps> Beck says that while she was staying at Greg and Kai's house, Greg told her that he didn't feel like he was talking to a 20 year old, but that he felt like he was talking to someone the same age as him. I felt like he was talking to this, uh, someone who was the same age as me. Kai, on the other hand, was cold to her and would avoid being in the same room as her. Uh, Kai was really, really just cold to me. Um, Did, was there anything romantic during that trip with you and Kai? No, no. How did Kai treat you during that trip, during your visit? Just, just awfully, like he never wanted to be in the same room with me. Um, he apparently was talking about me with uh, Sarah, who was there at the time. And Beck claims that when Kai and Sarah were playing around and running upstairs, Greg looked at her and said, if Kai were acting like this when I first met him, I wouldn't have married him. Sam began tweeting at Greg in 2016. In August of 2016, Greg ran an art contest for his fans, and Sam submitted a drawing that she made of Greg and Kai. With over 500 likes, Sam won the art contest, and Greg sent Sam a MacBook for winning the contest. In January of 2018, Greg flew Sam to his and Kai's home for the first time, and Greg introduced Sam online to his fans as his camera person. Greg says that Sam initially visited to get away from her controlling mother, and Greg said that Sam came to him for advice about whether or not to join the Air Force, but that Greg Greg suggested that instead of joining the Air Force, she should just come and live with him. That's totally normal, right? And the deal was that Sam would work for Greg for free in exchange for living rent-free in his home. Sam came out initially to be my camera person, and the agreement was that she would be my camera person for free. Uh, the room and board that she got, the, uh, the food and shelter, I mean, 
the free plane tickets, etc. Sam claimed that before she moved in, her and Greg agreed that they would not be in a relationship. But according to Sam, Greg did not tell Kai that Sam would be moving in. Sam claims that this caused Kai to be uncomfortable about Sam being there. When asked about his relationship with Sam during a stream, Greg said, Just think of Sam as a person, not anything else. People are weird when I'm around women, but life is far less weird in real life. Why do you think people are weird when you're around women, Greg? Why do you think you have that reputation? Throughout her stay, Sam did a lot of artistic work for Anision, since her main passion was working as an artist. She also filmed a lot of sketches with Greg as well. Gregory? Yes, sis. I believe I am pregnant. Oh my god, dapper girl. Whose baby is it? Whose baby is it? How could you say that to me? I just mean you've been with many of the men. I would not assume it is me. I have only ever been with the you. No! It was you. No! You put it in my womb. I reject what you are saying to me. There is a growing in This me. cannot be a true thing from your mouth. You did this. You will be the responsible. And also worked on her Twitch streaming. But according to Greg, while in the shower together, Kai told Greg that Sam made him uncomfortable. And because of this, Greg decided to... Sam had to go. So he sent her a text saying, hey, you gotta leave. According to Sam, the last week she was there was extremely awkward. Greg would tell her that he wanted her to stay, but Sam could hear him talking shit to Kai about her behind her back. And then Greg would hand her a plane ticket. After Sam moved out, things got very messy online. Then in various live streams, Greg went on to accuse Sam of being a ho and a homewrecker. And Sam in her live streams would accuse Greg of not being honest about his intentions when he flew her out to his home. I don't know, I think her trust is stronger than ever. Sam. I straight up tell on her. Sam claimed that Greg had a habit of hugging her while she was living at his and Kai's home. And while he was hugging her, his hands would travel to inappropriate places. Onision went on to claim that Sam made him uncomfortable with her action, but he never said anything about it when she was living there. And well, my general opinion on the situation is that this entire situation was at the very least a very toxic work environment. Imagine someone offers for you to work for them, but you have to live at their house and the entire time you're getting mixed signals about whether or not you're in a relationship with them. Their partner's also living at the house and their partner hates you and you're not really getting paid. You're just living in their house for free and there's children in this environment somewhere in the mix. No, thank you. Worst of all, Greg emailed a select number of his high paying fans images of him and Sam's private conversations. Greg made screenshots of his and Sam's private conversations a Patreon perk. Fans who paid him $30 or more could have access to the screenshots. Again, Greg became a master off of capitalizing and profiting off of the trauma that he put young girls through, which has to be even more traumatizing for these young women. So Sam responded to this through releasing her own screenshots through a member of a drama image board, along with a message that stated, Hey guys, thanks for still supporting me off of all the stuff that's been happening. I'm in a weird place because I've made it clear that I don't mean Greg any harm. But it's come to my attention that he's made access to our private emails a Patreon perk. I feel pretty violated. But he feels entitled to sharing this because, well, it's Greg. He keeps calling me a ho and a homewrecker. I hope you guys don't judge me for sharing, but I feel like I'm being bullied and I'm trying to stand up for myself. And unfortunately, Sam was not the last of the women that Greg has traumatized. According to Sarah, at age 11 or 12, she found Greg's videos through recommendations on YouTube. Sarah said she was in a really bad place in her personal life when she found Greg's videos and that Greg's videos influenced a lot of her opinions at the time. I went on YouTube and I just saw his videos pop up and I was really young, I was like 11 or 12. Oh, this guy, he's talking about like self and all of this kind of stuff. and. 
you know, he's really like speaking to me with all of this like self positivity and like I was in a really bad place. So seeing all that really made me gravitate towards him. Sarah claimed that when Greg introduced Kai to his audience at around 2012, Sarah became even more of a fan of Kai's than she was of Greg's. When Greg introduced to his audience, I became a huge fan, even more so than of Greg's. At this point, Kai was mostly active on Tumblr and Twitter, and gained fans through those platforms and his appearances in Greg's videos. Sarah claims that the first time she contacted Kai was when Sarah was only 13. Sarah emailed Kai about not being able to get into his Onision forums, and he answered her with advice on how to get in. When she was 13, Sarah also began tweeting Kai at that point. I actually reached out through Twitter. Um... And I would just like either, I would tweet him a couple times, but I really started tweeting his, uh, his spouse Kai a lot. And those tweets are what first got Kai to notice Sarah. And um, that's kind of who first noticed me. And Sarah claims that Kai began making Sarah his woman crush Wednesday. And they would always respond back to me or Kai would, you know, make me his like, Woman Crush Wednesday. When Sarah was only 13. When I started tweeting them, I was 13. Sarah soon joined a kick group chat dedicated to Kai's fans, in which Kai would use the group chat to talk to his fans. We all three would talk all the time. Like, honestly, when we first became <laughs> friends, we didn't talk just together very often. We were, me, her, and Regina were part of a group chat, yeah. and we talked. And... That's like all we did. I wasn't like nobody was in a relationship or anything like that. Regina, who was a teenage fan turned Kai's online friend, started a friendship with Sarah through this online chat. And Kai noticed their friendship and asked Regina if Sarah was trustworthy. You should be asking yourself that. Eventually, Kai DM'd Sarah, asking Sarah how old she was. And Sarah told Kai that she was 14. And Kai told her that she looked older. Sarah claimed that by the time she and Kai began talking, she was in a very dark place in her personal life. She had wanted something good to happen to her, and she had felt like talking to Kai was that good thing for everything else that was going wrong. Sarah described herself as quiet and insecure at school, and felt like her friendship with Kai at the time was validating because her idol was talking to her. She felt special for getting attention from Kai, like it was meant to be. When I first started talking to Kai, he identified as a woman and as straight, so I, I I just thought of it as like a friendship. I was in a very bad place. I was just quiet, I was insecure, and this made me feel some sort of like validation that like, hey, yeah, you know what? You're you're cool too, see? Like your your idols are talking. You're in on this with this celebrity couple, so to speak. Which, of course, we know as adults that it's a very unhealthy dynamic, not only because Kai has a power dynamic being famous, talking to a fan, but also because of the age gap, Sarah being young at the time and immature and naive. At age 14, Sarah received a message from Kai stating that he was about to delete Kick and giving Sarah his phone number. Uh, he sent me a message that said, I'm about to delete this app, here's my phone number, and he gave me his phone number. And at this time, I was 14. Sarah, Regina, and Kai began talking all together in a group chat and calling themselves the Three Musketeers. Sarah claims that Kai began talking about his life with Greg in the group chat, even talking about how big Greg's was. Both Regina and Sarah claimed that Kai began exchanging thirst traps or inappropriate photos with them in the group chat. Their claims can even be backed up by public evidence. In January of 2015, Kai tweeted an image of himself described as a thirst trap courtesy of Sarah. The image featured Kai laying suggestively with a censored bar covering his body, and many viewers called Kai out for sending such an inappropriate photo 
to a minor. Sarah claims that her and Kai became really close and would FaceTime all the time and stay up late together. She claimed she did whatever Kai wanted to do because she was such a huge fan. Kai told Sarah that he was worried about Greg knowing that he had an online 14-year-old friend. Regina also claims in her early Skype calls with Kai, Kai would try and hide her from Greg. But Sarah claims that the first time Kai showed a picture of her to Greg, Greg replied, oh, she's cute. And Regina claims that the three of them, her, Kai, and Sarah, would speak about how they could all run away together to get Kai away from Greg. This is something Sarah claims she would continue to speak to Kai about over the years. When Greg and Kai would have a bad fight, Kai would text Sarah Zillow time and the two would look at houses that they allegedly planned to move into together when they would run away. In January 2015, Sarah changed her name to Jailbait. Kai admits he used that name with Sarah, but claims it was the internet who came up with that name. At one point, Kai even tweeted at Sarah saying, I'm grooming you nicely. Kai even once tweeted at Sarah, I'm in love with you. Eventually, Kai and Sarah's interactions turned into a full-on emotional relationship. But Kai and I romantically talked when I was 15 years old. Sarah claims that when Kai and Sarah would play 20 questions, Kai would ask her if she was submissive, dominant, or a switch. Sarah says now looking back, she was only 15 and did not know about any of that. Sarah also claims she sent at least one photo to Kai at the age of 15. There was at least one picture that I had sent of me when I was 15 to Kai. Zero inappropriate photo exchanges. Sarah says Greg and Kai began planning Sarah's first visit when she was 15 years old. Sarah also claimed that Greg and Kai deliberately planned on waiting for Sarah to turn 16 until she could visit because the legal age of consent in Washington is 16. And did so, they hold off? Did they hold off until you were 16? Maybe. And why was that? So they wouldn't be breaking the law? It was agreed upon by them, and then they told me that they weren't gonna, like, have me visit or anything for when I was 16 to go up there because the legal age of consent in Washington is 16. During Sarah's first visit, Greg would allegedly pat her hair and say, You're so mature for your age. I feel like I'm hanging out with a 20-year-old. Sarah also claimed that Kai would put his legs on her and said it was a weird vibe. Sarah also claims that one of the first things that Greg said to her was, your face looks like how cream soda feels going down your throat. I remember seeing Greg for the first time in person too. He was really nice to me, kind of a weird way though. One of the first things he said to me was that my face looked like how cream soda feels going down your throat. Then, a little later on, Sarah was invited to live at Kai and Greg's house when she was only 16 years old due to problems that were going on in her personal life. I was going through a lot, but one night uh, after some really not so great stuff went down, I was outside crying, uh, texting my best friend, Kai, and he said that he was seriously going to talk to Greg about me living there. Sarah's mother signed over power of attorney to Kai in November of 2016. This was apparently so that if there was a medical emergency, Kai and Greg would have the rights to make medical decisions for Sarah. And Sarah claims that Greg joked that they would have the right to pull the plug on her. Sarah also said that at this point, her mother was not aware of this stuff that she claimed went on between her and Kai. Due to Kai gaining power of attorney over Sarah, Kai had full control over Sarah's bank account until Sarah turned 18. Sarah claims at some point in the future, Kai admitted to her that whenever they would get into a fight, he would check her bank statements to find out where she was and what she was doing. Sarah lived in the house during the time that both Billy and Ayala were there, and both of them have spoken about how much Sarah would clean the house and take care of Greg and Kai's children at the age of 16. Billy says she felt like Sarah was there to clean up and babysit for Greg and Kai. Sarah was there to like help clean up or at least that's kind of like what they like tend to 
get her to do. Using them as like their maid or their nanny and all of those things. We are I'm not, not a nanny. Sarah. We are not paying Sarah. She is not a nanny. If they didn't do those things, like if Sarah was not watching the kids up to par, like they would threaten to send her home. Just to clear that up. But unfortunately, there was even more darkness going on behind the scenes. In the lawsuit that Sarah filed in 2023 against Greg and Kai, Sarah reported more accusations of inappropriate behavior that happened while she was 18. Sarah claimed that Greg would caress her face and hand feed her bites of food. She claimed that both Greg and Kai would touch her legs and tickle her. She also claimed that she would receive inappropriate full body massages from Greg during this time, amongst a lot of other things detailed in the lawsuit. The groaning was very subtle to someone who was 16. Sarah was eventually sent home, as Greg and Kai have a tendency to do with everyone, but asked to come back when she was 17 to have an official job as their nanny and cleaner. Sarah claimed that one day when she and Greg were shopping at Walmart, she was joking around about shitty things that Greg had done to her. When she talked about an incident, when Greg had remarked about her booty, saying, dat booty dough. She claimed that Greg started freaking out and asking about what he did and if it was sexual. She said he was yelling at her and so she started crying. She claims he said, You're going to ruin my career. This is exactly what Kevin Spacey went through. She said when they got home, Greg ran in to tell Kai and said that Sarah needed to leave. Sarah claimed that Kai stuck up for her and said that Sarah had a job there, but Greg didn't care because has he ever. He freaked the f out on me like in a walmart and yelling at me all this so i started freaking out and i was crying and he like we got home and he like ran in to go tell kai what had happened you have to like leave or whatever so once again sarah was sent back home but greg and kai began planning again for sarah to come back out to visit around her 18th birthday only this time greg acted completely different around sarah the last time she visited greg was yelling at her but this time greg came to pick her up at the airport and was hugging her he wasn't being cold or distant towards her anymore and was being talkative i got picked up at the airport by greg as soon as I got off the plane, he like bear hugged me. The last time I saw him, we, we were like, he was like yelling at me. So I was like, okay, like what's going on? Sarah believed this was because she had lost weight, grew her hair out and had matured physically. She claimed that Greg even made a comment about it saying, girl next door moves back and she's super hot now. I had just grown up and like I had kind of blossomed. He said something about this, like girl next door moves back and she's like, super hot now. Sarah says she also believes that Greg was strategically mean to her in the past to batter down her self-esteem so that when he was finally nice to her and would suggest a relationship between them, her guard would be down. Sarah also thought that he broke her down so he could build her back up to whatever he wanted. Because a month before Sarah turned 18, Kai revealed that he and Greg were open to being romantic or sexual with her. Sarah claimed that Greg would become a puppet master with her and Kai, telling them exactly what to do. He was like the puppet master. He was being like, oh, you guys should do this. And Sarah knew that Greg could never be in a three-way relationship where he didn't also get to be with the girlfriend. So in order to be in a relationship with Kai, which Sarah desperately wanted, she knew she would have to be with Greg as well. I knew Greg could never be in a three-way relationship where he didn't also get to be with the girlfriend. Which sounds coercive, if not like forcing someone to be in a relationship with another person in order to get to a relationship with the person that they really want. It's just all so twisted. Sarah claimed whenever she arrived back home, Greg would pressure her to visit. 
He would call her late at night, telling her he missed her. She said that one time her and Kai were fighting, so she told Greg she was not going to visit, and he began crying over the phone. At one point, Kai was planning on visiting family out of state with their children, and Greg flew Sarah out while his family was away so they could have the house to themselves. Sarah claims Greg even canceled plans with his YouTuber friends to be with Sarah. Greg says that during this time, he took Sarah to see the live action Aladdin movie, and that in the theater, Sarah would look up at him wanting to make out with him, but that he didn't want to because Aladdin was such a good movie, and the vibe was off. Greg claims that Sarah guilt-tripped him and shamed him for not wanting to make out with her, and he said that the way she was acting was being creepy. She was creepy in the um, Aladdin movie. Let me show you what Sarah did. Okay, I'm watching Aladdin, I'm turning sideways because I'm a little taller than her and I was looking down to my left, that's where she was, and she does this. Up in me, during the movie. Like, like, you know, sh in the movie she's like shaming me. It was off and I didn't feel comfortable doing that right then. So, uh, she was shaming me. So, on the second day of the trip, Greg broke up with Sarah. And Greg says that one of the reasons he broke up with Sarah was because of the way she acted in the Aladdin movie. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. It's not funny. But Greg just can't be normal for two seconds. He said the other reason was he realized Sarah just wanted him and wasn't trying to make it work with Kai. And then after the film, she guilt tripped me for not making out with her. And that really really turned me off. I was like, this is really weird because you keep acting like I'm just your solo boyfriend and we're supposed to be talking about Kai. We're supposed to be thinking about Kai and building that relationship with Kai and making things work with Kai and all you seem to care about is me. Although now, Greg claims that Sarah is evil and immoral and was blackmailing him into having sex with her. I realized that what their intentions were were absolutely evil on every level. These things were piling up in my mind as immoral and horrible, etc. So I was like, I can't keep doing this. Like, you're right now, you, you extorted us, you got us into this, and we didn't want to be with you. After Greg broke up with Sarah, when she left the house, she had no money, no car, and nowhere to go. She didn't want to spend money on a hotel, and it was too late to call her friend, so she planned on sleeping on the street. Sarah says after three hours, Kai called her to check on her and convinced her to come back to the house. And then she left with her luggage and then eventually she came back because she had no f where to go. She was waiting. She, she had days until her flight. Like, where are you going? The story of Sarah is a really important story of why boundaries, especially between content creators and their younger fans, need to be established. Because it can be so easy for content creators to manipulate their younger fans and for something like this to happen. On September 12th of 2019, Greg's daughter supposedly fell out of a two-story window, resulting in her cracking her head open. Uh, I'm extremely, extremely worried about his kids. Like, I had my concerns before, but after learning what I learned today, I'm actually, you know, really terrified for them. The deputy explained that James Jackson called 911 and reported that his two-year-old daughter had fallen out of a second-story window by pushing the screen out. The deputy said, deputy said he had been out to the residence before, so this is, this, you know, he's had to return to the house multiple times for other things, and I'll come back to that later. Um, you know, he went out to the residence before to assist Child Protective Services in checking that the children are okay, basically. And Greg supposedly took a video of the aftermath of the incident. When the police questioned why he did this, Greg claimed it was to ensure that the doctors knew that he was not responsible, citing an incident that took place years earlier. Regardless, the police allegedly thought this was strange. I asked Onision why he took the video. He said he wanted to be able to show the doctor exactly where she had fallen. His explanation for why he took a video seemed strange to me. <laughs> that was the next, next sentence. Same. Same. The craziest thing is, over the coming days after this incident, Onision tweeted several tweets like this one. Stand in front of the window over there. The world should see how pathetic and helpless you are. I'm going to humiliate you. 
And right before you lose consciousness, I'm going to destroy you. Am I being taped? You are being taped. Oh, crap. Chris Hansen is an American television personality and investigative journalist who's best known for his work on the TV series To Catch a Predator. I'm Chris Hansen. No, you're not. Is that? No, you're not. Is that? And in 2019, Chris Hansen became involved in the Onision story. Although, unfortunately, his involvement with the Onision storyline wouldn't necessarily end with the justice that everyone was hoping for. In 2019, Greg and Kai were accused by several women of them when they were underage. Six other women accused Greg of abuse as well, and Greg would continually deny these allegations. In 2019, some of these women were interviewed on Chris Hansen's YouTube live stream called Have a Seat with Chris Hansen. Then, on January 4th of 2021, a three-episode docuseries titled Onision in Real Life premiered on Discovery's streaming platform. It featured an interview with Onision's estranged father, Randy, who talked about Onision's violent past and how he attacked him. YouTuber Eugenia Cooney, who talked about Onision's harassment campaign against her. And the docuseries also features Shiloh. The entirety of this journey in the last 12 years has really been me thinking that I was totally alone in it. When I found out there were others like me, it kind of ended a long 12 years of me thinking that there was nobody else that could understand what I was going through. I felt a little less crazy for sure, Shiloh said. Hansen's interview series gained popularity and even accumulated into an attempt to confront Onision outside his own home. 911, what are you reporting? Hi, uh, there's a person who's been stalking me online and they just showed up to my house. Stalking you? Yes, he's a oh. stalker. He's yelling, he's yelling things at me through the door right now. It's Chris Hansen. Uh, they went to this person and said a bunch of mean things about me. And so now this person's trying to, like, aggressively pursue me in a really hateful way. Greg, are you there? This would be a great opportunity for you guys to tell your side of the story here, talk about the controversy. Prompting the YouTuber to file for a restraining order against Repsion and the wrong Chris Hansen. Kai and Greg filed petitions for orders of protection against Chris Hansen and the YouTuber Repsion, who made a ton of videos calling out Onision during the time all of the drama reached ahead. The protection order against Hansen, however, could not be granted mainly because the wrong Chris Hansen was served papers. According to Mike Morse Law Firm, the wrong Chris Hansen responded in a court statement saying, I, Chris Hansen, request a motion to dismiss the complaint from the plaintiff due to improper service. I have nothing to do with this very public case and do not know the petitioner or the intended respondent. This case involves an ongoing investigation of the petitioner by investigative journalist Chris Chris Hansen, former host of the show To Catch a Predator. I am not Chris Hansen from To Catch a Predator. Given that I'm not the intended recipient of this complaint, there shouldn't be a case against me. I'm not the person the plaintiff is seeking harassment protection from. The court dates were posted online and spread, and Greg ended up attending court, which ended up becoming a massive drama online as people reacted to, well, his court appearance and the attire he wore. People also recorded videos of Onision in court and posted them online. And Greg did end up appearing in court with Repsion. But once Greg appeared in court, he also asked that the petitions be dismissed. And luckily, Repsion raised a GoFundMe to cover the legal fees, which helped in that aspect, even if it ended up being a big waste of everyone's time. Have a seat with Chris Hansen sparked the survivor-led campaign hashtag D platform press which called for social media sites to ban Onision. Newsweek obtained a call log from the police department that states that the FBI has opened a case and are reviewing Onision's video content following public concern. The problem is viewers eventually lost trust in Chris Hansen due to his web producer Vincent Nicotra, who allegedly didn't pass along vital evidence to the proper authorities 
and was eventually arrested for aggravated harassment in September of 2020. Hansen tweeted that there was not much he could say since Nicotra was under an active investigation. As you know, I've recently been reviewing the actions online and in person of my web producer, Vincent Nicotra, things he's said and done without my permission and without my knowledge. I've come to the conclusion that I can't condone much of what he's said and done, and I can no longer work with him in any way going forward. He's not going to be involved in any further projects. I do want you to know that I will continue our very important investigation into YouTube streamer Onision and the impact of his actions on his victims. I am in constant contact with law enforcement investigators to forward this project, and I promise you that I will continue to treat the victims in these cases with the utmost respect and dignity they deserve. Already, this was bad publicity for Chris Hansen and his coverage of Onision, and it was additionally reported Hansen signed a deal with Investigation Discovery to do a TV series on the Onision story, which sparked a debate in the YouTube community over whose story this is to tell in the first place. What's going on with this Chris Hansen investigation? There was obviously a massive hype train around seven months ago. A lot of people were making videos on it. A lot of people were talking about it. It was quite genuinely the biggest topic on YouTube for a good week or so. And people have been wondering, where is Chris Hansen? What is he doing? Because originally, every Everyone thought Chris Hansen would be the guy to take down Onision. Chris Hansen allegedly selling the Onision story to a major television network, to Chris Hansen being exposed by other YouTubers, to Chris Hansen seemingly abandoning the story for other cases, and also Chris working with a lot of shady people with their own allegations against them, and also the possibility of doxers being involved. Which is unfortunate because it all distracts from the larger issue at hand. There are so many victims in this story. This story, the the story of Onision is a story that spans across, well, Onision's entire life. A pattern that repeats itself time and time again. That you can see pop up from the moment Onision starts to obsess about relationships. Where you can see Onision perfect his craft of manipulation, victimize women again and again, and profit from it. Utilizing his platform as a way to participate in the and the entire discussion over Chris Hansen and the docu-series that he, well, profited off of as well, is just further profiting off of these survivors' trauma after Onision did that as well. Repsion even said that several of the victims said they did not want their stories or trauma told on national TV, and I was told their stories would be included regardless of their consent or not. Most of the victims have disassociated with Chris Hansen because they felt lied to, betrayed, and exploited. So what can the survivors do? What's the right way to tell their story? Or the right way to seek justice? Sometimes going through different government entities can take a long time, and they have to deal with reliving their trauma again and again through different people who may not believe them, or may not be used to the YouTube platform. Well, there is another option, and that's the route of taking legal action through pursuing a lawsuit. On February 9th of 2023, it was reported that a lawsuit is being filed against Gregory Jackson and Kai Avaro for using Onision's popular YouTube channels to recruit, solicit, and groom underage children into having sex with him, with YouTube and its parent company, Google, also named in the lawsuit, as co-defendants for continuing to monetize his channels. The plaintiff, Regina Alonzo, mentioned in the Sarah chapter, alleges that Alvaro engaged in flirtatious conversation with them when they were a minor, sent them pictures, and attempted to bring them to, well, their Washington state home. Then, on March 2nd of 2023, a second lawsuit was filed against Greg and Kai, as well as YouTube and Google, this time by Sarah. She was groomed by one of the most famous YouTubers and his spouse when she was just a teen. Carla, he told you in that exclusive interview that he doesn't even know the woman who named him in the lawsuit. Reliving and retalking and rehashing everything out brings back like a flood of memories and I feel like I'm 15, 16 again and 
you know, experiencing everything for the first time. The suit claims that specifically Onision appealed to minor females like plaintiff who were young, vulnerable, questioning their self-image or identity, or were seeking answers and guidance. And the trial is set for November 1st of 2024. And now Onision is banned from almost every major social media platform. Onision was moved from Patreon for doxing. Greg posted screenshots onto Twitter of text messages between himself and Billy, some of which included her phone number, which means that he shared her phone number to the general public. A Patreon spokesperson confirmed to The Verge that it considered those actions to be doxing, which violates its platform's rules and justified Onision's ban. Yes, we removed Onision from Patreon as he violated our bullying and harassment as it relates to doxing, a Patreon spokesperson told The Verge. Wow. 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 So you guys are so into yourselves. Like, you are so committed to censoring innocent people. Once Onision knew that his days online were numbered, at a final grasp at the platform that was slipping away from him, he began making breakdown videos. Greg made a skit making fun of Eugenie Cooney, made a Sims version of her, and kept making videos on her after she asked him to stop. Also, Greg, stop being mean to me. Greg has stated himself that these videos are not real, that they shouldn't be taken seriously. <laughs> The funny thing about asking me if I'm okay is that implies that you actually take my videos seriously. If you take my videos seriously, wow. Wait, they're not real? What the fuck? Wow. What my Speaks videos have proven is that people who make videos about me are the dumbest motherfuckers on planet Earth. So people have questioned whether or not Onision has been making breakdown videos in order to plead insanity in case he's taken to court for his quote-unquote interactions with underage girls. Shiloh has even spoken on Onision's breakdown videos in a tweet saying, Unfortunately, I know this moron so well, I can say 100% that he either thinks this is the most brilliant work of his career or that it actually might pass as insanity in court. Either way, Greg, someone grossly misinformed you. What a shit performance on all levels. Because in fact, only 0.85% of cases have an insanity plea entered on behalf of a defendant. And either way, it's obvious that most of his breakdown videos aren't real and were a last attempt to capitalize on the mounting backlash against him before everything implodes. Not that they weren't entertaining. But also, dude, you have children who are going to see all of this someday. <laughs> Is this what you want, huh? Is this what you want to turn off? Melt down! You like kombucha? I love kombucha! <laughs> And uh, ever since my Patreon got deleted, I haven't been feeling very good. <laughs> Do you have no shame? Onision has one last goodbye video titled Goodbye. Onision was framed and socially executed. People are so quick to try and make living as a human being miserable. Do you understand? Like people online are so quick to to pick someone who they think is above them, that they want to pull down to their level or whatever and just try and do everything they can to destroy that person's life for the lulz. And that is the internet environment that we are currently in. We're in a community that is terrifying. So I had a great time, um, but things have changed a lot. And I don't want to talk about all my problems. I don't want to talk about like the things people tweet or the videos people make or the things people say in the national television. I, like, it's so crazy. <laughs> I was just a guy, you know, I was just a, a random guy serving in the US military who was making stupid, funny videos. And then it blew up into 
me getting like 2 billion views before Adpocalypse. I got like 2 billion views on my videos because I was working every day and, and neglecting my life. Yeah, so I'm, I'm leaving social media is what I'm saying. Uh, and I've said it before, but my reason has never been this good. Ever. In the description of the video, he says, Onision was socially executed by a disgusting and unforgivable, malice-driven, fraudulent smear campaign. Always the victim. Onision's life was destroyed by someone he rejected and removed from his life due to them being a danger to him and his family. Again, he rejected this person, therefore he's the victor and they're the one that's in the wrong. The person Onision removed confessed to doing extremely illegal drugs, dealing with illegally, violating him and another person, and other behaviors. No, I'm not going to do this victim blaming stuff. Onision was a musician and a comedian who dedicated over a decade of his life to entertaining his fans, campaigning for equality among genders, animal rights, infant rights, women's rights, and charities designed to feed the poor and the hungry. Onesio now has changed his channel banner to be a graveyard and his profile to say, rest in peace. And Onision is trying to blame all of this on one person, that one person being Sarah, seemingly not recognizing the larger pattern here, which I feel like we've probably reflected upon in today's video, that Onision is to blame here. Onision's a monster. Onision dug his own grave through doing the same thing over and over again, the same mistake, not being able to just be happy with what he has, but having a continual need to involve young women in his life and inflict more and more damage onto them, and not being able to let that pattern go. And not only that, but have to show it all publicly and continually profit off of traumatizing them. Through Onision doing that, he was the one who ended up himself as he predicted he would do all those years ago. Remember, you're just talking to a ghost. After years online exploiting his victims for profit, filming it all, Greg finally met his demise and declared bankruptcy. That's right, all the YouTube AdSense that Onision had made throughout the many years that he's been on the platform seemingly went poof. And now that Onision was no longer making videos, he could no longer afford his lifestyle. I declare bankruptcy. Wow, Grungle really loves to F around with his money, doesn't he? I'm really not surprised about this after all. It was posted publicly that Greg and his husband filed for Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Now, I don't encourage anyone to go looking at all of these legal documents that have been posted online for the family and their children's personal safety, but in the documents, it shows that Greg owes 1 to 49 creditors money, that their assets are worth 500000 to $1 million, and that their estimated liabilities are between 100000 to five. Greg also claims to be making around $2,000 a month from the company Nizaya Motu Incorporated. But what is the company Nizaya Motu? Well, Nizaya Motu seems like a kind of shady company, as you can't find much info on what the company does other than it being linked back to Onision. But it's hard to say. A lot of people speculate on Nizaya Motu being a shell company, basically a company that exists on paper but does not provide any services and is used to store funds in. There's further proof on Onision's link to the company in that he used the company name a long time ago. A user with the name Zayamotu posted a review saying, awesome shirt. I love all American fighter shirts. This one in particular is exceptionally awesome due to the color combination. The fabric quality is consistent with other American fighter shirts. And there's photos with these reviews that seem to at least from the images, look like Greg's photos. Now, this bankruptcy doesn't seem to be because of anything other than the fact that once the YouTube paychecks and Patreon paychecks stopped coming in, Greg was continuing to spend more than his household income and seems to need to pay back creditors and debtors, according to this Reddit comment. 
but they're filing under Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Chapter 13 basically means that you pay your debt or a portion of it back with one month payment for three to five years. According to their documents, they're only making around 5K with a monthly expense of 5,550. So with the Chapter 13 plan document, it says that they'll be paying $500 a month for 36 months, three years. Long story short, a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, as stated, typically means someone's repaying their debts over three to five years. And the biggest advantage is that you don't have to foreclose your home. I'm not fully familiar with bankruptcy proceedings, the process, and what one has to do. But according to YouTubers involved, Onision was in bankruptcy court and named a whole bunch of YouTubers who are involved in past dramas. There has been speculation that because a letter was posted which named a ton of YouTubers and that letter has now been leaked to the public, that this means they're going to try and sue the people named in the letter or take them to court. But based off the contents of the letter that's been leaked, I believe personally this was just a petty letter that was leaked to who Onision considers his biggest enemies in the public domain. The header of the letter simply says, plan and notice of bankruptcy case filing. And in the letter, it simply has a declaration that the bankruptcy filings have been forwarded to all the people on the list. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know if this means that Gregory has a plan to sue or ask ask for money from these people in the future. But now the news is out there. Greg has lost it all. And with the lawsuit out there, who knows how much more he'll lose. From millions of followers to declaring bankruptcy. It's a fitting downfall for the story of Onision. And that's the story of Onision. Thank you so much for making it to the end. I really appreciate it. Comment. I was going to say RIP Onision, but honestly, he doesn't deserve to rest in peace. So um, if you made it to the end, comment good riddance Onision. <laughs> I think that's a better way to say it. And I hope you guys are all doing well. Sending you all peace. And if this video is particularly triggering for any of you guys out there, my heart goes out to you. Recovery is not an easy path and I'm right there with you. Sending love to you all in the comments and hopefully we can all heal and grow together. Also, thank you so much to my team who works super, super hard to get these videos out. I have so much appreciation and love for you guys. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Hope you're doing well until then. Bye. Thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. Go to rocketmoney.com slash cruelworldhappymind or click the link in the description to get started for free. Thank you.